Welcome to the Nitty Gritty Law School, Thank which, by the way, does not exist. <coughs> that, that's why it is on the announcement. You saw it in the brackets. Um, <coughs> but there's a story behind it. There was a fellow by the name of Bob Foster who used to go around recording uh, a Roger Elvick. And he was selling the videotapes. And um, I, uh, <coughs> anyway, I had some problems with the court. It wasn't performing as advertised. So uh, <coughs> I eventually contacted Bob Foster. And uh, we're supposed <coughs> to have audio here any second now. Um, is the audio working on that? I haven't, I haven't heard that. Just oh, that's a problem. Quiet, we'll just let Bill save his voice and just okay. <coughs> yeah, we're supposed to have uh, auxiliary vocal cord support here. <coughs> but anyway, um, Bob Foster sold me these tapes of uh, Roger Elvick. And Roger Elvick is the world's worst presenter. He's probably one of the smartest people in the world. And <coughs> when I would talk to him or I listen to him on the tape, either way, whatever he had to say, it might have taken me a year, a year or so. <laughs> it might have taken me a year or so. And you one, two, three, four, five. You got the volume going there? Okay. It would, it would, it'd take me a year or so to catch up on this and, and figure out why it is that uh, he was right. The interesting thing about Roger Elvick is no matter how indecipherable what he had to say was, he was never wrong. Eventually, I'd find it, like I said, it'd take me a year to figure out why, but it turned out he was always right. So over, over a period of time, I uh, reorganized what he had to say in my uh, one, two, three, four, five. Are you okay? <laughs> All right, we got got a good good volume there. A little bit of ring. That's we're gonna get. Yeah. Okay. Well just. Got a, got a bad voice, one thousand. Okay. <laughs> so. Um, um, anyway, I sorted it out in my head and eventually organized it and. Uh, and I had a lot of advice from a lot of people and so forth, as we all get. And uh, eventually, this is what resulted. Well, Bob Foster had the Nitty Gritty Law School. And basically, he sold videotapes of Roger. <coughs> so when he had a heart attack and passed on, his wife asked me if I would help out. And I said, well, sure, I'd be happy to. And so she had people call me. And uh, over a period of time, I got a lot of uh, vicarious experience, uh, maybe 150 cases or so. And so uh, <coughs> the, uh, uh, I think I've pretty well got it honed down. Now, I want to tell you that we all started off using the statutory approach. We all believed the message that the courts were there to help us. And, uh, and we've all seen the failures of the court system. So um, so th the Founding Fathers were quite shrewd. They understood the abuse of power. They understood, they'd seen, they'd seen the extreme with the king. And they put in some interesting features in our Constitution that uh, are, are now starting to uh, come out, starting to uh, apply. And we're finding out that despite the fact that the government has taken over the school systems, and despite the fact that they have deleted the subject of civics from the curriculum, uh, the information is still there. If you read the Constitution slowly and, and, uh, and ponder over the words, you begin to realize it's quite a, uh, although it's in simple English, it's also quite uh, in-depth in how the uh, <coughs> uh, government has been uh, fenced in. <coughs> By taking over the school system, the government has also changed the meanings of some words. They put a little twist on it so that uh, we misinterpret what was the original intent of the Founding Fathers. So <coughs> anyway, the uh, Constitution is not a living document. It has meaning, and it's there to protect us. 
when the need arises. So, <coughs> although I, that's technically wrong, it, it's really there to keep uh, government constrained. So, um, I've sort of inherited the uh, nitty gritty law school name from Bob Foster, and every once in a while I bring it out. I used to have a website called Sovereign's Paradise because this is our concept sovereignty, the sovereignty of the individual sovereignty. And uh, <coughs> so I call this a joint venture between uh, uh, Nitty Gritty Law School and Sovereign's Paradise. So <coughs> here we are. Now we have a little CD. Um, I'd like to pass the paper around and get your addresses because unfortunately I was planning to spend the whole week preparing for this and have them ready for you. But as it turns out, a uh, couple of people got arrested. That sort of uh, took precedence over preparation and uh, <laughs> it's been a hard week last week, let me tell you. And uh, so, but anyway, this CD, what I'm showing on the screen, <coughs> you're going to get. Now in the past, I've passed out a small CD. That small CD had something like 58 megabytes of information on it. This CD is bigger. It has a quarter of a million bytes on it. <coughs> it's a lot of information. I've got the, I've got uh, several, uh, reference law books on it, okay. I have uh, the Constitution of the for the United States of America, <coughs> okay. Analysis and interpretation. <coughs> I have um, <coughs> the uh, United States Code, <coughs> Title 18 of the United States Code, Title 28, and uh, <coughs> you know what? Title 26 is on there too. However, it didn't show up on this menu. That's what doing things in a hurry does, but it's hidden on there. There are a lot of uh, there are hidden files on this thing. Uh, let's see if we can. Uh, see if I can show it to you. <coughs> Here we go, and we'll go to uh, the law notes right there. And in the subdirectory called law notes, we have, uh, you know what? Ah, I see the problem. We're on the C drive. Let's get out of that. And let's get to uh, <coughs> here. This is also centered on how to use a computer. Yes, <coughs> that's correct. Yes. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> he, okay, we're on the uh, the D drive, and we will go to the uh, <coughs> start here. Says programs, but what we really want is all files. And now we go to start. <coughs> Here you are. Now we go to the reference law books. And it's a little slower because it's on the CD. But <coughs> I have Bouvier's Law Dictionary. We have an internet link to Webster's 1828 Dictionary, which is. Uh, <coughs> very valuable at times when you want to know what the original intent is. We have uh, uh, some excerpts from Cuffler's uh, common law pleadings. Okay, uh, specifically, I pulled out a few things relating to motions. Okay, this CD will continue to be developed. So, uh, from time to time, I guess it's good to check back and see if I've, I've updated it because I intend to put the things that we need on it. Uh, on Cuffler, just to, just to go there for a moment. Uh, <coughs> we have uh, 
We have chapters, uh, a, a table of contents which shows everything in Koffler's common law pleading. So if you want to know what's in the book, it's there. We have chapter eight, somebody had done, they put it on a PDF file. And then we have uh, a bill of particulars, that's a motion for a bill of particulars. That means you want somebody to say exactly what the charges are, not just have a fluffy, cloudy thing. So this shows you how to demand a bill of particulars under the common law. Motions to strike under the common law, uh, non-suits, directed verdicts, uh, after the trial's over, how you ask for a new trial or uh, arrest of the judgment, repleter. So I put some kind of some essential things. Those are all done by motion, okay? Um, <clears throat> also, we got Matthew Bender, uh, Forms of Pleading and Practice. And let me tell you something, that is really one useful book. <clears throat> Even though you're in common law, uh, you should go to Koffler's. It's all statutorily oriented, okay? But it's a tremendous checklist. Remember that when you go into court, you want your paperwork to satisfy both requirements, the requirements of statutory law and the requirements of common law. The common law is the superior law, and whenever there's a, if there's a conflict, of course, you go toward common law. But it's good to have everything, because remember, the people you're dealing with are somewhat ignorant of what we're doing. Attorneys are not trained in common law. You're, you're on Mars as far as they're concerned, okay? The judges go to special seminars, and the judges have to understand this just in case somebody comes along that knows about it. But it's so rare, they forget. So if you go to Koffler's, uh, I mean, uh, Matthew Bender's books, they have two books that are really useful. One of them is called Forms of Pleading and Practice, and the other one is called Points and Authorities. And these two work hand in hand with each other. When you put together paper, you can lift the wording right out of it. It's great. They, they build these books based on cases that won. Okay? So it's really good. Uh, I highly recommend that series of books. There's also other good books, too. A famous one is Witkin. Which, uh, or you can go buy them in any legal bookstore, you know, but or they can order them. It's basically West Publishing, I think, is the one that that publishes these things, or most of the legal books. And they're very expensive. You're better off going to your public library, which subscribes and keeps them update. Not public library, but your, your law libraries. Most counties have a law library. Um, okay, so we, have the, we also have the uh, Constitution of the United States uh, here. And I have Title IV, which relates to the flag. Title 18, which relates to the uh, criminal procedure for federal. Title 26, which is the Internal Revenue Code. And Title 28, which is the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. Now, all these, these two books, Title 18 and Title 28, also have in them, at the end, the rules of court. So you're getting a double package there. Okay, it's built into that, that system. And then, of course, uh, sometimes the uh, Act of the Confederation and the Northwest Ordinance comes in handy. All right, then we have California, both constitutions. Um, we have one person in here, by the way, that's never heard of common law like we've heard of it, okay? And so uh, that person only knows uh, statutory law and is very good at it, by the way. So um, <coughs> I'm going to re reiter reiterate a little bit of what you already know. Uh, it's good to have a reminder anyway. Uh, now I also have on here the entire California code, okay? So uh, when you click on California, so you can look up any code that's in California on this CD, okay? Pardon? Yeah, and I and and the capacity, the cap the capacity is 650 megs. So think what I can do. Believe me, I'm going to build this collection. I want to make this a useful tool for people like us. Yeah. Okay, now this is very crudely done by normal computer you know, programming standards. Basically, what I did is I have the table of contents for each one. I just put the abbreviations, like BPC is Business and Professions Code, uh, CV is the Civil Code, CCP is the Code of Civil Procedure. All right, so I figure you're probably smart enough to figure out what the abbreviations meant. 
and then the actual codes <laughs> are listed here, okay? It gives you the range. Right down here you have the range, okay? So you can see what they are. And again, <laughs> it's got the entire list. So that, I hope, will be a useful tool. Yeah. <clears throat> see, I'm not a good speaker, so I'm trying to compensate for <laughs> by giving you this CD. Hope you get something that's worth your money. <coughs> so here you are. And then finally, I have the anti-government movement guidebook. Now, <coughs> well, you can laugh, but what this is, this is a book written by judges for judges, and the whole purpose of it is to figure out how to get around our legal argument. They are not concerned with, geez, maybe you're right. No, they're saying they, they, they actually spent money. The judges' organization actually spent money, hired consultants, and brought them in so to, to figure out how to get around us. <laughs> yes, sir? I got that about two or three years ago. So uh -huh. is this the updated version? No, it's not. No, this is, this is the old version. Okay. But the interesting thing about it, if you read it, you will see with the understanding that you all have of common law, you will see that these guys really don't get it either. They're, they're as helpless as we are in, in when we start out. Okay, so uh, when you go into court, it's not good enough to cite what the law is. You also have to explain it. You, every paper I submit is pretty much a little course, a little education course in law for the judges. Not for the attorneys, just for the judges. I know the attorneys are a lost cause. Okay, they, they know I'm on Mars, they're totally convinced of it, and over and over and over again I hear attorneys saying to the judge, Your Honor, I don't understand the paperwork, I don't understand what he's saying, I don't understand what he's doing. They say things like that. Judge understands though, he went to, he went to the special seminars that they put on for judges. So he understands, or if he doesn't understand, he quickly understands because somehow he seems to understand the paperwork better. But the attorneys are lost causes for some reason. I've never. Actually, I've never met a single attorney anywhere, anytime in all the conversations I had with them. Not one has ever known what a court is. They practice in it, and yet they don't know what it is. And uh, so I'm going to make a quick run through the basic principles. That's, I figure the first hour we'd kind of spend on that, and that will help to give a perspective or remind you of the perspective here, what we're doing with this. Uh, this uh, uh, whole process. Uh, I do like to push the devil and Daniel Webster right here because <clears throat> that author had remarkable insight. I don't know where he learned what he learned or whatever, but this guy, when he wrote the story, he covered really two important points. He showed how a court is put together he, he was correct in everything he did in this story relating to common law courts. And uh, just uh, the arguments that went on between the devil and, and Daniel Webster. And very important, he tells you how to deal with a jury if you ever get in front of a jury. He had a jury that was picked, properly picked by the way, by the plaintiff. Okay. That, that was the devil. And every one of the jurors was an American because that was what uh, uh, Daniel Webster demanded. And they had, but the devil brought in people like Black Bart, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and a few, <coughs> a few others. And the jury foreman was, <laughs> was something else, or the judge was something else. Anyway, it was an excellent story. And I, I, it's very entertaining, it's quite short, but boy, it sure illustrates the principles. So anyway, let's go to the law notes here. <coughs> so um, quickly running through it, we're going to go deal basically with the foundation here, okay, for this first hour. And <coughs> This little saying by Cicero is really, really important. Uh, I, the most important thing that in this whole process, believe it or not, isn't in the books. The most important thing is you have got to have the right attitude. 
believe me, if you have the wrong perspective, it's going to screw you over. Okay? You have to have the right attitude. If you have the right attitude, you will say the right things automatically. I have to tell people, the government is not your enemy. Okay? There are definitely people in there that are your enemy. Um, and there's no question about it. You go into court, turn your back, you'll get stabbed. But you have to have the attitude that you're, they're your friends. That doesn't mean you trust them. That just means you treat them like friends. You be nice to them. When you're not conducting business in the courtroom, you're nice to them. You go to the clerk's window, you're nice to them. Believe me, we have had some very, very profitable moments because of the fact that we were nice to people. They liked us and decided to help us behind the scenes. Okay? So don't assume that just because somebody's on the other side of the counter that they are your enemy or they're out to make it life hard for you. Even when the clerk tells me my paper is wrong and I know he's wrong, I do what he says as long as I don't sacrifice any of my rights. Okay? I'm not there to argue with him. I'm there to win. Are you there to fight or are you there to win? I'm there to win. And so I, I spend a lot of time. I go into a facility. I have a standard joke I tell everybody. A lot of you have heard it before, but I'll tell it again. I go into a facility. There's always new spaces anyway. They never seem to tell each other this joke. So it's always fresh to them. But I always say, you know, when I'm dealing with a clerk or like I went over to a jail to see a, a prisoner and uh, I'm, there's the uh, sheriff there, you know, guarding the entrance to the jail. And I just friendly with him and I say, hey, did you hear about that big uh, fight over at the uh, federal court? This guy fighting his parking ticket? And of course they always say, well, no, you know. <laughs> And of course, it's kind of unbelievable anyway. Somebody's fighting a parking ticket in federal court. I say, oh, yeah. He says, uh, I said, the guy went in there and, uh, and he argued and argued. And the judge finally got exasperated and said, well, Mr. So-and-so, he says, didn't you see the sign? And the guy says, yeah, Your Honor, I saw the sign. It said fine for parking. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, that joke's short enough, targeted enough. They love it, OK? Every one of them loves it. <coughs> and, and that really is an icebreaker. And so when you go in, you talk to these people, be nice to them. You'll be amazed at how they'll accommodate you and so forth. It took me four days to get, uh, Ron Boggs was in earlier talking about uh, a lawsuit that got filed. And uh, it took me four days to get that sucker filed because they never heard of a counterclaim. <laughs> okay? I mean, there's, so I accommodated. I called, OK, you want complaint? I'll put complaint on it. Remember, on your papers, titles do not count. What counts is the substance. You can call something a complaint, and it's actually a habeas corpus. OK? So it doesn't matter what you call it. What does matter is the actual text in your, in your action, whatever it is. So sure, I had it all laid out properly, and then Suddenly, they didn't like this, they didn't like that. And I knew the guy wasn't asking me. I knew he was just ignorant. But of course, uh, you know, how do you educate somebody when they think you don't know? OK? So I accommodated it, and we eventually got, and I would, and he says, well, you can't have such and such on there. So I take a black ink and I black it out. You know, redact? I did lots of redacting on it, OK? <coughs> as long as the basic thing didn't get changed, we were fine. So now it's in. We'll see where it goes. In the meantime, uh, we're suing judges and DAs and public defenders are getting sued too. Got 28 defendants, by the way. So <coughs> we're, we made a project out of them. Normally, I only target one defendant, but I could see that we had to make an impact somewhere. And besides, it costs $300 per person in LA uh, County Court to file an answer to uh, an action. So. Uh, the, you know, the county needs the money. So <laughs> I'm helping them. Okay. So, all right, now it, it's important to speak the right language. Remember in America we speak three languages, right? We got the language of the street, which, which changes from day to day, block to block, town to town. Okay, very unstable language, but the street language has a lot of slang in it and so forth. That's a, that's a whole separate language. You know, when you when you, when you see something that's really cool happening, you say, man, that's really hot, okay? Well, that doesn't, that doesn't work in formal English, but it works with slang. 
Okay, in, uh, uh, we have formal English, that's the second language, and the third language is the language spoken in the courtroom. Third, uh, the courtroom English is very, very stable, and it will, uh, it, it has, you know, it might take two, three hundred years for a word to change its meaning. So, courtroom English is a, is a good, uh, good reference, good thing to use when you go to court. And words do not mean in the courtroom necessarily what they mean in business English or formal English. So you have to study it as if it were a separate language. You know, it's good to be trilingual in America if you can speak all three English languages that are spoken here. And when in doubt, speak legal English. And Eng legal English, you know, I mean, and we have, we have dictionaries that explain legal English. And, but they're not called dictionaries. I think one of the dictionaries that is available in the library is called Words and Phrases. Okay, what is there, about 100 volumes in that, that little dictionary? Or maybe it's 50 volumes, whatever it is. It's a, it's a lot of books. And, uh, and they, they spend several pages just explaining what the word T-O, two, means. <laughs> you know? But there's been battles on that. And so if you want to really know English, you read those books. If you, if you just want a running start at it, take the Constitution, start with the first word, pretend you never saw the language before, and every time you meet a word for the first time in, in that context, look it up in that dictionary and see what it means. You might be surprised. That's how I learned, by the way, to speak some of the words. Okay, anyway, next question is, is uh, or point is, people or citizen, which one are you? Okay, the people own the government, the government owns the uh, uh, citizens. That's, basic, that's the basic relationship. And <coughs> this is based on the preamble as far as what, what, the, what the relationship is between people. See, I cannot tell you what the word people means. Okay? If you ask me to define people, I don't know. But what I do know is that I'm one of them, <laughs> and according to the preamble, the cre preamble defines, it doesn't say what people are, it only says where they're from and what the relationship is to the government. See, if you, look at the, if you look at the preamble, I'll pop down there to it, it says, we the people of the United States, okay, that's, that's who and, and where from, and our purpose in order to form a more perfect union, etc. cetera, and, uh, <coughs> and who the beneficiary is, it's ourselves and our posterity, all the elements of a trust, by the way, uh, do ordain and establish this Constitution for whom? the United States of America, that's the, that's the trustee. Okay, we are the trustors and we are the beneficiaries <coughs> and the United States of America is the trustee. So, okay, then we have, uh, <coughs> here's the key words right here. Ordain and establish, okay. To ordain means to make law, to authorize. Grab a seat, sit down anywhere. <coughs> and. Uh, um, we, uh, and to establish means we actually created the Constitution. So it's by our authority as people that we create, th that this thing comes into existence and it's establish it, we are the ones that created it. And who do we do it for? For them. So if I make a bowl, okay, does the bowl suddenly own me? No. no. See? So if I authorize the government to exist, if I create a business, if I'm the owner of a small business, does the, o does the business suddenly own me? No. I can step in. I may, be, I may decide to hire a manager and be the janitor, and, I'll, and I may voluntarily take instructions from my manager. <coughs> but anytime I want, I can walk back in and take over because I'm the owner. And so the people... We, we can, for some purposes, be a citizen and for other purposes, not a citizen. Just like for some purposes, I could be a janitor or not be a janitor in my own company. So, okay, um, <coughs> so that basically defines the relationship between the people and the citizens, I mean, and the government. Now understand one thing, I am accusing myself of being one of the people. No one else is accusing me of that. If somebody comes along to me and says, I don't think you're one of the people, prove you're one of the people. No, that's not how it works, fellas. 
it is up to the accuser to prove I'm not one of the people. Okay? Burden is on them. I can make any claim I want on myself, but it's up to them if they don't want to believe it. They've got to come up with the evidence that I'm not. Okay? And that's a fundamental relationship that we have here. Okay, now we go down to citizens. A citizen of the United States operates on different terms. For one thing, it's the 14th Amendment right here. Amendment 14 inverts the, rela the uh, relationship. Basically, uh, where is it up here? Must be further down. <clears throat> well, I don't know what I did with it. But anyway, in the 14th Amendment, uh, basically it says that if you are born or naturalized in the United States and if you are subject to the jurisdiction of the United States, then and only then are you a citizen of the United States. Okay? So if you're subject to the jurisdiction but not born or naturalized, then you're not a citizen. Or if you're born or naturalized but not subject, you're not a citizen. Okay? So if you were born here but you're one of the people, then you're not subject. So therefore, you're not a citizen. Now, what they do in school, they don't teach us the words of freedom. They only teach us the words that bind us. And so they teach us that you should be a good citizen. They, they displace the subject of civics. Civics, by the way, means the study of personal rights. They display that. They brought in a new course, which they chose to continue to put under the shadow of civics, the name, but it was actually American government. It was back in around 1950 that they got honest and started calling the classes American government, or social studies, I think was another ruse. So the, uh, uh, so they teach you to be good citizens. And they say you have duties, which is true. All citizens have duties to their masters, okay, to the government. Uh, when they, when they uh, uh, passed the 13th, 14th Amendments, what they were doing, they said they were freeing the slaves, but that's not true. What they were doing is they were transferring the, sla the slaves out of private ownership into public ownership. And they did that for the black people. But then, because of the wording and the fogginess that comes with the modern education, they then transferred, they're trying to transfer the, the white people also into slavery. See, the public slavery. And slavery I'm defining as not being able to do what you want, when you want, where you want, but rather you have to work at someone else's orders. Okay? So. Uh, citizens have to have driver's license, marriage license, business license, uh, special licenses for special things, whereas if you're one of the people, you don't. Okay? Of course, that's theory. In actual practice, there are problems with enforcing your rights. So we compromise sometimes. Sometimes some of us do get driver's licenses, and we do get business licenses and so forth because we just don't want to spend time battling. But in theory, the licensing is only for the citizens, not for the people. Okay, well, enough of that. There is a difference between people and citizens, and this is covered in this CD. Okay, the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights, basically, uh, that is part of the instructions to the, uh, uh, to the government. Understand one thing, that when you sue the government, you should never, ever claim in your lawsuits that your rights were violated, okay? Because they're no under, under no obligation to not violate your rights, okay? Whenever, you, whenever you ha your rights have been violated, the proper way to say it is that the government exceeded its jurisdiction. And because it exceeded its jurisdiction, you then became injured in the loss of your rights, okay? That's the proper sequence. Because, uh, all right, so now here we have, I went to um, the uh, Senate document 99-16, which is also known as the Constitution of the United States of America Analysis and Interpretation. 
and there's a complete copy of that on this on this CD. But I took an extract of it, and on page 956 and 957, there's a footnote 12, and in that footnote they list all of the bill bill of rights or bills of rights that are available to the citizens. Okay? And they also list the ones that are not available to the citizens. Because remember, a citizen has no rights. All a citizen has is privileges granted by the government. Okay? But in order to keep the scam going, because after all, uh, governments do have an allergy to revolution. So in order to keep it going, they give it a name that misdirects the attention of the citizens. It's called civil rights rather than civil privileges. Okay? So, uh, but civil rights are legislated rights. People, you don't see a list here for, for people be, for one simple reason. People have all rights. Okay? You don't need to list them. All right. Now, but freedom of religion, that's been legislated and court decided that that's okay for citizens. Freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of assembly and a petition, freedom from search and seizure, okay? Uh, double jeopardy, freedom from that, freedom from self-incrimination, just compensation for loss of property, okay? Uh, <coughs> amendment, uh, the Sixth Amendment is somewhat diluted, but you still have somewhat of a right to speedy trial, public trial, jury trial, impartial jury, notice of charges, confrontation of witnesses, compulsory process, you know, and right to counsel. Those are all legislated privileges. What a citizen does not have, he does not have a right to keep and bear arms. However, that's such a popular item that they wouldn't dare directly outlaw it yet. Okay? Not that they're not trying, but uh, the right to keep and bear arms is not a right. It's actually a privilege at this point for citizens. Now, for people, people have a right. But citizens do not have a right. It's a privilege. Uh, there have been no cases on quartering troops in homes. We haven't gotten to that yet. But uh, they've just decided to put it over in that, well, you don't have a right to resist quartering. Even though there's no cases, they put it in that column. You do not have a right to a grand jury indictment. <coughs> so you don't have a right to protections from, from the government by way of the grand jury. That's why so many cases are, are conducted based on uh, uh, information, okay? You know, the district attorney files an information, and then it goes to the magistrate, and the magistrate functions like a grand jury. He decides whether or not the, the uh, DA can proceed. But, uh, yeah, you don't have a right to uh, a grand jury indictment if you are a citizen. Again, on, serious, on a really serious case, such as murder, they always get an indictment. Why? Because I'm sure some sharp attorney is going to figure out that if he didn't indict, that he would, could come back and say, hey, uh, you didn't indict. And that would become a big political fiasco, which they don't want. So they'd always indict on murder. Okay, and then uh, you don't necessarily have a right to a jury trial in civil cases. So, and then you don't have a right to reasonable bail. And you don't have a right to not have excessive fines under, you know, under the equal protection deal. You don't have a protection from that. Okay. How many? How often do you see a, uh, uh, let's say, a uh, um, hundred thousand or five hundred thousand uh, dollar bail on a tax case and a ten thousand dollar bail on burglary? We've seen it. Well, anyway, if you're a citizen, you don't have a right. And so they're assuming that everybody's a citizen, and it's really hard to make it clear. Um, anyway, so that's, uh, that's just a little summary. And that's right out of the Senate's uh, research document. Okay, then we have sovereignty. So <coughs> this is the key to what we're doing here today, okay? Because I want, I, I want to cover this because later on when I talk about motions, this is going to come up. But basically, uh, in Chisholm versus Georgia, they said at the revolution, the sovereignty devolved on the people. 
and they are truly the sovereigns of the country, but they are sovereigns without subjects, with none to govern but themselves. Okay? The citizens of America are equal as fellow citizens and as joint tenants in the sovereignty. Okay, well, they're talking about citizens there to some bit. Yeah, they're joint tenants in the sovereignty, but actually, if you actually are sovereign, then uh, <coughs> you're not even a joint tenant. You know what I'm saying? Maybe you're joint tenants in the ownership of the government. <laughs> but, okay, but in the New York case, Lansing versus Smith, the people of this state, as the successors of its former sovereign, are entitled to all the rights which formerly belonged to the king by his prerogative. What are the rights of the king? Well, ask the king. He'll let you know. <laughs> okay? So, you have all the rights that you think you, whatever, however you define them. That's different from, from uh, citizens. Citizens have their privileges des defined for them. Okay? So, um, I don't forget that point because I exercise that when I make my motions and stuff. All right, republic versus democracy. This is what makes it all work. <coughs> the, uh, um, you all said the Pledge of Allegiance, right? I pledge allegiance to the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, okay? Well, it's a republic, not a democracy. Let me explain a democracy. A democracy is mob rule. A democracy, 51 beats 49. In a democracy, the minority has zero <laughs> rights. No rights whatsoever. In a democracy, the majority says what is. If the minority has any, any privileges, it is those that are granted at the goodwill and pleasure of the majority. Okay? That's a democracy. The demo in, in a democracy, the sovereignty of the state lies in the whole body of the people. So the whole body of the people express their will through the voting system, majority rule, but then the whole body splits up and all the individuals are subject to whatever the whole body had decided. So understand that whatever the whole body of citizens vote for, that is a mandatory force that goes on the citizens. Have you, did you, by the way, has anybody heard George W. Bush say that uh, he's got a mandate from the people? Yeah. Yeah. He's right. He's speaking legal language. He's correct. He's got a mandate on the citizens. Okay? That's how democracy works. But this is actually a republic, but it's only a republic for the people. The citizens operate as a democracy. All these rules, codes, whatever are, they're mandatory on the citizens. If you're one of the people, then this is a republic. And you'll see, here's the definition, and this is straight out of Black's Law Dictionary, by the way. <clears throat> now, if you look up democracy, you'll see this definition. That form of government in which the sovereign power resides is and is exercised by the whole body of free citizens directly or indirectly through a system of representation as distinguished from monarchy, etc. Okay, that's Black, Black's Law Dictionary, fifth edition. Not even the best edition, <laughs> okay? <coughs> All right, now, but if you look up Republican government, you can't find it in the dictionary. You find democracy, but you can't find Republican. But if you look under government, they hide it there. Under government, they have a subclassification, Republican government, and it is one in which the powers of sovereignty are vested in the people and are exercised by the people, either directly or through representatives chosen by the people, to whom those powers are specially delegated in. And that was in Reed Duncan and you know a couple other cases there. Okay, now, one thing to understand about the word people. The word people is both plural and singular. The word people is not the plural of the word person. If you want the plural of person, you say persons with an S. Okay? I don't know if you ever watched the uh, O.J. Simpson trial when they had the uh, Fourth Amendment issue in the municipal court. They were trying to decide whether or not to pass this case on up to the Superior Court for prosecution. 
and uh, it got to be quite a big deal. It lasted several months, and uh, uh, the judge, I know the judge didn't know this. She's a municipal court judge. She couldn't have been this sharp, but she had help from somebody. But uh, when she read her decision, she never once used the word people. She always said person or persons in the entire thing throughout. And what were they doing? Well, they were treating O.J. Simpson as a person or as a citizen, not as a people. That's why. So the Fourth Amendment did not apply in this case. That's basically what they said. <laughs> All right. Well, anyhow, let's see. So the, the thing about a Republican government is this, that the people can exercise their power either directly or through the representatives. Well, I take that concept seriously. I'm one of the people. I've got the power. Okay, and in this case, power means the legal wherewithal. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to do. I'm a king, and I'm going to do what kings do. And one of the things that kings do is they have their own courts. Okay, so I also am one of the owners of the country. So what I do is I. Since I already own the Superior Court, my own private court, I also name the Superior Court. And I put my papers right in there. I let their warehousemen store my papers. Their warehousemen are called clerks. Okay? So, anyhow, the, uh, um, the thing about being sovereign is that there is no higher law. Okay? There may be a higher moral law, there may be a higher God's law, but there's no higher secular law. Okay? So, and I'm of this world, and so I take my sovereignty seriously. I am sovereign. And it, it tells you what a sovereign is. In various cases, they've decided it. For example, uh, <coughs> let's see. Further down here, I think I have something. Um. <clears throat> oh, it's not. I guess it's higher up. Oh, this is republic versus democracy, so it's the wrong place to be talking about sovereignty. But the thing is, is that <clears throat> as a sovereign, you can either Delegate a task, or you can do it yourself. Either way. So I do it myself. It's this, this whole court business is much too important to leave to judges and attorneys. Okay? And so, and you have to understand that when the, when the people vote on something, because there is no higher law, because you are in your sovereign capacity, anything anyone else says to you is merely advisory not mandatory. So with citizens, the law, whatever it may be, even if it's not real law, even if it's code, it's mandatory. But with people, it's advisory. Now there's an exception to the advisory rule, and that is that if you have 100% of the other sovereigns against you, then you're wrong. <laughs> okay? Now, in, in uh, Greece, a jury consisted of a thousand people. The Grecian theory was that uh, no one was rich enough to bribe all jurors. <laughs> okay? That was actually their premise. Well, here in the United States, for whatever reason, and we inherited this from uh, England, for whatever reason, we've decided that 12 is a big enough number. And so if you got 12 people against you, you get convicted. But if you got one person on your side, then you walk. And the, uh, uh, you got to understand that, statistically speaking, those 12 jurors each represent one twelfth of society. And if, if you could be convicted on an 11 to 1 vote, that would statistically mean that one twelfth of society has an opinion that doesn't count. So in our society, the minority is important too. In, a, in our Republican society, okay? So with the Republic, because the minority is important, 
if you've got one twelfth of society on your side, well, maybe that's a different opinion rather than a crime. You see? So it's, it's a, one of the beautiful features of our system. Okay, let's go back to, uh, let's go to, back to sovereignty here. Okay, so here's, here's one that I like. I think this pretty well says it right here. In the, uh, in the Bagley Keene Act, which is the California Government Code, section 11120, and in the Brown Act, which is section 54950, and all of this stuff is going to be on the disk that I'll, I'll mail to you. Um, uh, they both of these, both of these acts have the exact same sentence, and it says, <laughs> right here, the people of this state do not yield their sovereignty to the agencies which serve them. <laughs> now, <clears throat> all right, so I do not yield. You want to mess with me? I'm not yielding. And I'll come back at you with my counterclaim. Okay, so that, that, by the way, is in the government code. The government code is instructions from the legislature to the government. Yes, sir? When you couple that with uh, the truth is self-evident, it's very simple and understand. <laughs> okay. To hold this truth to be self-evident. <clears throat> yeah. That's in the, uh, the uh, Declaration of Independence, right? Okay. All right, now, <clears throat> just to, uh, to uh, see what sovereignty means, it's the power to do everything in a state without accountability. Now, I don't have it here, but in my research, I found out that each of us is a state. Every sovereign is a state. Okay. But we also have some other interesting things that I like. For example, well, this is back to uh, what citizens are. But <clears throat> the very meaning of sovereignty is that the decree of the sovereign makes law. So you see, when you file a common law lawsuit, when you are in law, <clears throat> you decree, because you're sovereign, you decree what the law is. So when you file your, your lawsuit, you have a complete package. If you do it right, you'll have what looks like the same thing as what you see in a normal equity lawsuit. In addition to that, you have all the evidence packed in with it. Okay? In equity, they let you file a lawsuit without the evidence. You can show up later, or the opposition can get it from you under discovery rules. In common law, there is no discovery. Why? Because there is nothing to discover. Okay? When you file that lawsuit, you hit them with the whole package. Got the evidence and everything. When they come up with their answer, they better attack your evidence then. Otherwise, if they fail to object, it means they agree. Okay? So, also, you present your arguments. You do everything. I mean, it's, it stands alone. There's no need to have a hearing. Okay? At least not from my point of view. I've, it's all there. And we laugh at them when, they come, when, when the opposition wants to do discovery. Discovery about what? <laughs> you know? It, we, we just say, go fly a kite. Well, what they're going to do is they're going to go to court and, and get a motion in limine. Great. <laughs> hey, I'll volunteer for that. Go ahead and limit my evidence. You know? I'm, I'm happy that they won't let me present any more evidence beyond what I've already presented. <laughs> okay? It's all there. So, anyway, that, it makes it, it, it really simplifies the case. Sometimes I do go along with discovery only because I know it's running up their cost. <laughs> Remember, a lot of lawsuits are wars of attrition. Okay? Well, you know how to run their costs up. So the thing is, is that um, sovereignty means that the decree of the sovereign makes law. Okay? There you are. Now, this is an important case right here. I love this case. 
This is a reservation of sovereignty. This is Marionette All versus Jicarilla Apache Tribe. And what happened was that uh, Marion went into a contract with the Apache Tribe to do some mining and haul some materials out. And uh, uh, they made the arrangement, splitting the profits and everything. And after all the equipment was in and they had a going operation, the Apache Council said, you know, we need to apply an extraction tax. So <laughs> the corporation screamed to high heaven on that one. It ended up into the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, uh, sorry, Mr. Corporation, but uh, they're sovereign and they can tax. Okay? And here is, here it is. This is what the Supreme Court said. All right, if I can get it right here. It is one thing to find that the tribe has agreed to sell the right to use the land and take valuable minerals from it, and quite another to find that the tribe has abandoned its sovereign powers simply because it has not expressly reserved them through a contract. To presume that a sovereign forever waives the right to exercise one of its powers unless it expressly reserves the right to exercise that power in a commercial agreement turns the concept of sovereignty on its head. Now, why is that an important case? Because you've heard it. Gee, if you've got a social security number, you've given up all your rights. Gee, if you've got a driver's license, you're, you've given up all your rights. Uh-uh. No. That's a narrow contract. It's there. It's subject to all the rules of commercial contract. And you're still sovereign. Okay? So that case is the linchpin case that preserves your sovereignty if somebody wants to use that excuse. Now, understand what contract fraud is. If you and I go into a contract and I know something that you don't know about this contract. And I know that if you knew, you would not go into the contract. And if I fail to inform you of it, and I go into the contract with you anyway, that is fraud. And that crashes the contract. Well, guess what? They come up to you, you say you have a social security number. You are obligated to the contract. I don't know if they'd say it that plainly, but that's what they would do. And so my question is, well, show me. And they come up with this law. They call it law. I call it a code. Okay? And they say, here, this obligates you. I'd say, did you know that at the time we went into the contract? I didn't know that. What does that do to the contract? That's right. So I have no problem with the Social Security number and driver's license. I admire those who fight the battle, but the fact is, is that I've been fighting so many bigger battles with other people and so forth, helping them out, that I haven't really taken time to take care of those, those issues. Okay. All right, now let's see. What is the definition of a court? Okay. Well, <coughs> let's see. Now we have court of record and so forth. Let's talk about, uh, I'm going to skip that just for a moment. I want to talk about court etiquette. I think you guys, I see people going to court and they really don't understand some of the unwritten rules of court. Okay? Real important here. Number one, whenever you are in court, you never talk to the other side directly. You talk to them through the magistrate. Okay? It's true they can hear everything you're saying, but you direct your focus, your attention to the magistrate. You speak to the magistrate. You talk about the other side in the third person. Him, her, it, whatever. But you talk to the magistrate. You never use the word you in to the magistrate. The magistrate is a figurehead he is merely representative of the court. He is not personally involved. Okay? That's the theory. 
So whenever you talk to that to the magistrate, you always refer to the court. Okay, if the court agrees to this, or the court wishes this, or the court, whatever. Another important custom is that you never, you never control the court. Not if you're one of the the litigants. Okay, in other words, you don't say the court's attention is directed to such and such. What are you doing? You've now taken command of the court when you direct the attention. What you should do is you should say, the court is invited to see such and such, or to take this into account. You invite the court. You don't say the court uh, is directed, that type of thing. It's a common error. I see attorneys do it regularly, okay, and they're wrong. So your judicial notice? Well, a judicial notice is the court taking notice of something. You're not ordering the court. Nobody orders the court, not even yourself, not even your own court. Okay? You're, you may be the owner of the court as a plaintiff and sovereign, but you do not order the court at all. The court is above all that. Okay? So you never, ever direct the court. You never, ever tell the court anything. You invite the court. Okay? Sometimes you hear people say, may it please the court. Okay, in other words, if it's okay. Yes, sir? Correct. You submit, you submit things to the court. You don't order the court. The court's the only one that issues orders. Even if you are the court, okay? Now, let's get into the definition of a court. But I just wanted to say that little bit about the informal type thing. What is a court? The dictionary definition is that it is the person and the suit of the sovereign. Okay? So you don't have a court unless you have a king or a queen. You don't have a court unless you have a suit. Okay? Now in the old days, meaning going back 500 years, a court consisted of the king on his throne and all the courtiers in the room. That was the court. People didn't know how to write. The court record was the memories of the people, okay, the, the, of the courtiers that were there. If the king forgot something, he could ask one of the courtiers, what do you remember about this? So that, that's, that, was the, the, that was, it was the king, the sovereign, and his suite, okay? The suite was all these people. Well, later they dropped the E off of suite and it became suit. If you look in the older dictionaries, it, it says it's the person and suite of the sovereign. Well, the modern suite is actually the suit, or in other words, all the papers. So the people, the courtiers, now became pieces of paper. But the concepts are identical. Okay? You look to the paperwork for the memory of the court. So um, that's technically what a court is, the person and the suit of the sovereign. Since you are the sovereign, you file a suit, guess what? You cannot be non-suited. Nobody has any authority to throw your suit out. That's what a non-suit is. Okay? In your, you're in your sovereign capacity. The sovereign cannot be non-suited. All right? You'll find case law on that if you go looking for it. I may have accidentally included that in here. I don't know. But uh, you cannot be non-suited. That's one of the things that you've heard of uh, suit being dismissed for failure to make a claim upon which relief can be granted. Well, um, I've got something in there in here that relates to that. So you can look that up if that issue comes up. So a court is a, is, um, yeah. a, a court is the person in suit of the sovereign. Now, that's the technical definition, but what's the real definition? <clears throat> the real definition of a court is that it's a stage upon which the sovereign puts a good show to convince the rest of the world that he is right. See, you're sitting on your throne, 
and you look out the window and you see some knave out there stealing oranges off your orange tree. No problem. You send the guard out, you pick him up, throw him in the dungeon. Right? You're the king. You know you're right. He knows he's wrong. What's to argue? Well, <clears throat> on the surface of it, that looks good. However, the problem is this, is that the knave has friends. And although kings are sovereign, they also die easily. And if he's in the dungeon and everybody thinks you did an unfair thing, what's going to happen to you as the king? Okay, so they came up with this clever system. They have a trial. They bring it all out. Everybody's invited to the court. Okay, we've got lots of courtiers running around at the center of power. And so you put on this, you present the evidence and so forth. Now everybody knows that, I mean, even though they're his friend, they knew he asked for it. So the king gets to live longer. That's why you have courts. And I want you to understand this. This is perhaps the most important aspect of legal procedure that you must remember. Do not fail to forget this because it, it is extremely important. You are putting on a show. You are there not for your benefit because you know you're right, not for the defendant's benefit because he knows he's wrong, you're there because you're convincing the rest of the world you're right. So do the things that sell your case to the world, okay? The court clerk has rules. The attorney, the opposing attorneys have a rule system they believe in. When I structure my paperwork, you can hardly tell the difference between it and what an attorney would do, excepting for certain key things, like I'm one of the people, okay? I make that claim. So that it's very subtle what I do, but it's legally solid. And on the other hand, the attorney reads it, it makes sense to him. It's in the form he's accustomed to. This is all part of a sales job on him, okay? Because if you don't do that, they're just going to say, you're crazy, okay? And even if you're right, you're crazy. Okay, I'm trapped in this thing. <laughs> There it is. There we go. <clears throat> Here's the cover page. Here's the cover page of a habeas corpus that somebody did. Okay? Nice big letters. I made a short presentation on purpose. Has nice big letters on it. Uh, doesn't conform at all to the normal form of the rules of court, okay? I can tell you that no matter how right she is, people looked at that and said, this is crap. The judges look at it. The attorneys look at it. Okay? So don't do that. Don't call on the powers of Yahweh, okay? <laughs> You've seen it in the paperwork. Look, you know, I, I believe in God. I think, you know, God it does us a lot of favors, a lot of times. I see it in my life that events unfold where there was this mysterious hand of destiny that somehow protected me or whatever. I've seen that actually happen. But if you look at the Bible, and I'm not big on the Bible because I never study it, but I do know a couple things about it. And one of the th claims of the Bible is that this is Satan's world. And God's letting him play have this as his playground until that Armageddon shows up, okay? So if you're going to be dealing with these secular people who are ungodly or Satanistic in their approach or whatever they are, by all means deal with them on their terms because God has informed us in the Bible that he's holding back. He's letting this guy have his show, all right? So I know that when I put in all references to God and all references to the Bible and, and my God-given rights and so forth, that's falling on deaf ears. That not, does not make a good show for Satan. So uh, and there's a lot of good people there who are trained under Satan's rules, but they have a good heart. So you've got to give them good paperwork, good arguments that they understand. Remember, I'll tell you, one of the most glorious moments that I've experienced 
was one time this woman went down to uh, court to file a paper. It was a Friday morning. She was there from the moment they opened until noon, trying to get them to file papers. She actually s created her own order, sovereign order, ordering the clerk to file the papers. She got absolutely nowhere, okay? But she followed the first rule, which, which was to put on a good show. She was friendly to the clerk. She had long-term relations with the clerk over, over the many months that this lawsuit was going, you know. So she had a good rapport. Very important, have good rapport. And anyway, but she got nowhere with the clerk. The clerk said, no, look, if you want me to file this, she says, I don't think I have to file it. But if, if you are right that I have to file it, you get your remedy is to the appellate court. You go to the appellate court, you get an order, and that, they will order me to, to uh, file the paper. And this lady said, no, I'm giving you the order. I'm in the United States District Court. This is the person in suit of the sovereign. I'm the sovereign. You have to accept the order. Well, I got nowhere, okay? So at noontime, she went home, and she called me on the phone wondering what to do, and we chatted about it and so forth. And... Uh, we theorized, you know how that goes. <coughs> the next morning, Saturday morning, she got the mail, and there was a letter from the clerk. The clerk wrote her a letter inviting her to bring the paper down to sign it. Because Friday afternoon after she had left, the clerk researched the question, found the specific code authorizing her to file it. And the code specifically was Title 28, Section 1361. I hope I'm remembering that correctly. And this is the section. Title 28, Section 1361. 1361. So Section 1361 says this. Not word for word, I'm paraphrasing. But it says that the United States District Court has original jurisdiction in a mandamus requiring a public employee to perform a duty owed to the plaintiff. What happened to the defendant? It's just the plaintiff. Boy, was that a revelation for me because it shows right there. You see, the sovereign, the plaintiff, is the owner of the court. The court is his staff. If, if there's a government employee who is being borrowed by the court, doing duty in your court, He's in your jurisdiction. You do have jurisdiction over that one. You can order them to file it or whatever. In contrast, the defendant is an outsider. He's outside your castle. You've dragged him in, but he has no jurisdiction over your people. So in the, in the federal system, the defendant has to go to the appellate court, which can then order the lower court to do whatever. Okay? Yes? As defendant? Everything is a defendant. Well, of These course. All defendants. Well, if you're being accused, of course. Yeah. That isn't why, but that's just how these things are organized, okay? Well, so. They don't have to accept the defendant's paperwork. No, they that's do. What I was well, that's right. They don't have to. And so you, you have to go to the appellate court and get them to order it. However, defendant or not, you can always ask them to file on demand. Yeah, everybody familiar with anybody here who does not know what file on demand means? Okay, what it is is that you go up to the clerk and the clerk hassles you and he says, no, this isn't right and so forth. Now, <clears throat> normally I follow it, I say, okay, thank you, I fix it, you know, and I come back later. But sometimes it might involve rights or it might involve timeliness. Maybe, you know, you're going to be late if you don't get it filed. That can happen. So whenever the clerk rejects your paperwork because of some rule. Understand that what she's doing is she's following instructions from the power structure. The judges create the rules and if she breaks those rules, she'll get in trouble. Okay? So, if you tell the clerk, yeah, 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 I understand all that, but file on demand. What she will then do is reach under a table, pull out a little rubber stamp, stamp your paper, and it'll say filed on demand. Okay? Then what happens is the judge gets this paper, he sees the file on demand mark, he knows that the gig is up, he knows that, that the clerk tried to do her job, he won't get mad at the clerk, 
and you file it. Now, it's up to the judge to reject your paperwork, but of course, if you're sovereign, you can deal with that. <laughs> what about if they reject it? <laughs> they were send it back and unfile it. If they reject it? Well, we'd have them send it back and just unfile They've unfiled it. Well, they can't do that. I know they can't do yeah, that. Yeah, no, they, 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 they can't do that. They do okay. They do it all the time. I know they do. Well, you just send it. Uh, now, I know that some people have had <coughs> success when they, w when they were up against the system. They couldn't, somehow, you know, they're up a wall, okay? What they would do is they would send it by registered mail. And when they got it, it stuck. Yes? That's why we, that's why we do it this way. In his case, you send it by registered mail, file on demand. They have to file it. Well, I, I don't, like I say, I don't know the the specific rules for this, but I do know as a, an overall national pattern from what I've seen, when you register it on a, in those tough situations, they, but you see, if you have that kind of a problem with them, I suspect what happened is, is that they hate you, <laughs> okay? You're, you're, not, you're not dealing with procedure anymore, you're dealing with personalities, and you need to correct that because you're violating the first rule, which is you got to have a good show, and you haven't put on a good show. Okay? I mean, that's basically the problem. And you, you need to do some salesmanship here. Yes, sir. So are you saying that if they hate you, that's down to you to fix? Yeah. To correct whatever you're doing? Absolutely. You're the salesman for your own case. You're the salesman for your own case. If they're giving you a hard time, it's time to ask yourself why. Now, if you've put their personal uh, status at stake, like they might lose something from their paycheck or they might get fired for doing something, that's a different story, but you gotta, you got to figure that out. But basically, what you need to do is you need to do a sales job. They see you. I'll tell you what I did one time. I went, I, uh, the very first time I got involved with this business of issuing an order to the court on my own signature, I filed, I, there was a case going I went up to the municipal court clerk. It was a small court, okay? It was actually uh, in Redwood City, okay? Relatively small court. Mm -hmm. I went to Redwood City, and I asked to see the clerk of the court. They brought out their supervisor, the top one of that, in that installation. And I was dressed like an attorney. I looked like an attorney, every bit. I had pin pinstripe suit, proper tie, you know, vest. I, I really looked like an attorney. No beard. No beard. That's right. And I went up to there, and uh, like I said, I requested to see her. So she came out, and I said, uh, I introduced myself. I said, uh, I'm, I've been, I'm working with this case. And the reason I'm talking to you is I said, we're going to do some really strange things on this case. And I just didn't want you to think you had a bunch of crazies out here. So just as a courtesy, I wanted to let you know that there's something coming down the pike, and I just want you to be prepared for it, you know? It's just a little consideration. So when my case showed up, and I'm issuing orders and filing, you know, stuff, uh, it was no big deal, okay? A couple times she had to come out to approve the paperwork. You know, the lower clerks didn't understand it. From their point of view, she broke the rules. In fact, she was better trained, and she understood but there was zero animosity between us. We were very friendly. I told her my parking joke, you know. <laughs> and believe me, that it makes a difference. So, yeah, if you're having a hard time filing papers, you need, you need to rework it. Now, I understand that sometimes that, you see, every formal system has behind it an informal system. And the judges do talk to the clerks. Okay, they do talk to the sheriffs. There's communication back there that's informal, down at the bar somewhere. They talk about cases. Understand that. When you have everybody at the bar saying, yeah, we know him, he's a pretty good guy. You know, he just, we like him, something. Just unbelievable how that greases the wheels for you. So don't, the first thing is have an attitude, a good attitude, friendly. Uh, they're just doing their jobs. I know that there are some people out to crucify you. At least pretend, okay? I had a judge, I'm not a judge, a, an attorney one time screaming at me as so loud in the Orange County Superior Court. Anybody been in that Superior Court building? It's a big building, you know. The, the halls are like, uh, what, 300 feet long, something like that, length of a football field. And he was screaming at me so loud, 
I heard the echoes bounce off the end. Okay? <laughs> Made me feel good. <laughs> but, you know, that... <laughs> yeah, it was an encore, automatic encore. But anyway, this, the, the uh, uh, but I stayed friendly with him. You know, yeah, okay, okay, you know. And, but he, for some reason, didn't like my motions. He was the guy, by the way, that uh, I was in chambers with one time. And the court looked at my paperwork and he said, uh, who wrote this for you? I said, nobody. He said, you did this yourself? I said, yes. He said, well, where did you learn this? You know, because I'm, like I said, I write my papers like an attorney does. And I pointed to the, the evil attorney across the way and I said, I had the finest instructor in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, he was. He pulled every dirty trick you can imagine. I probably had every possible permutation of motions and things going on because of this guy. And I'll say, tell you, he kept me really, really up late a lot. But boy, did I learn. And it's great having it. If you ever get an adversary, it can really be beneficial for you, believe it or not, even though you're in a lot of pain at the time. <laughs> so anyway, uh, be f I I'm telling you, be friendly toward the court personnel. I it's so important. And cops and everyone else. Hi. Well, actually, um, I'll mail out a bunch of CDs to all of you. You're welcome to make copies. Uh, sure, I don't copyright any of my stuff. I'm, going to set, I'm trying to set a different standard on these uh, meetings. I think that when we have an all-day seminar, you should be comfortable, well-fed. <laughs> I hope you are. Uh, that whatever materials are offered, you get. It's included as the price. I never believed in this, you know, come in and nickel and diming you, okay? So you're going to get the full package. If you want extra uh, DVDs of this meeting, uh, you can get Dennis Whipple's address and just order it from him direct. That's how he makes his living, is doing this stuff. He does a good job. He's all over the place. Uh, hopefully he brought a stack of business cards so that you can all, you know. Yes, sir. Also on the web, Orange County Freedom Forum's website will tell you how to get a hold of Dennis. Okay, and what is the website? I don't think everybody writes as fast as you yeah, talk. It's very slow. Use that mic there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Make it real slow. Okay. It's All right. HTTP. HTTP colon slash slash. Freedom forum. Freedom. Give them time to write it. The word freedom. Freedom forum. Forum. OC dot tripod dot com. Yeah, slow down. Uh, forward slash Freedom Forum OC again. Uh, forward slash Freedom Forum OC. For, forward slash. All right. Can you go over that one more time? Now, here's, I got a suggestion. Or go to Google. As, you, as you say it, I want you to write it yourself. Okay. People will be able to keep up with you that way. Okay. HTTP colon uh, slash slash after slash the colon freedom I know forum but he doesn't know OC dot tripod dot tripod dot com dot com uh, slash freedom forward slash freedom forum freedom forum OC OC that okay. should get you to the website, that and that has, that has uh, Dennis's uh, address all on it as well. I guess I can put it up on my website, too. You, you all know my website, 1215.org? Yeah. yeah. Okay, 1215.org. Tell them it's a Magna Carta, right? Yep. That's the year of the Magna Carta, 1215. Okay. Let's see now. Where are we here? 
<clears throat> All right, now, court of record. What is a court of record? Well, a court of record has five requirements. The fifth one is optional, but it keeps a record of the proceedings. Okay, what is a record of the proceedings? Let me explain what a record is. A record, a court record, is very, very simple and sparse. All it is is what the issue was to be decided and what the decision was that was made. That's it. That is the actual court record. Everything else is supplemental. Okay? But the true court record is the issue to be decided and the decision that was made without the detail. Okay? So a court of record keeps a record of the proceedings, and that's what it is. Now, the fourth point, it has the power to fine or imprison for contempt. Points one and four you will find in the uh, Black's Law Dictionary, fifth edition. Okay? Now, I like Black's Law Dictionary, fifth edition. I also like Black's Law Dictionary, fourth edition. The fourth edition has the real law. The fifth edition has the dictionary modified in order to express policy, power structure policy. The fifth edition is what the power structure wants the attorneys to know. The fourth edition has the real law in it. This is why I have two dictionaries, because I like to know what the enemy knows or doesn't know. So when I put in my papers that I have a court of record, I know that the attorneys know that points one and four apply. Okay? I also know that the attorneys do not know about the other three points. So it generally has a seal. That's number five. That's optional. Okay? The third one, proceeding according to the common law. That means no statutes. Okay? That means no equity. Which point is that? Three? Number, two. number three, right. Right. And you'll get this on the CD that I'll mail to you. But <clears throat> it's proceeding according to the common law. <clears throat> now, oh, by the way, everything I've shown you is on the website so far. We don't have to wait for the CD. No, you don't. If you don't have to wait for the CD. You can go to 1215.org and, and anytime you want on the internet. 1215.org. But <clears throat> The, it's proceeding according to the com common law. That means no statute. That means no vehicle code, no penal code. Okay? No government code. Not for you. For them, maybe, but not you. Doesn't apply to you. Okay? There's no health and welfare institutions code. Okay? All right. Now, <coughs> yes? This black four says... Yeah. Quote blacks fourth and then quote black seventh. Where does what rest? Well, that, that just tells you their policy. You see, law does not change. Okay. Precedent holds. And one of the nice things about the fourth edition is that it cites cases to support the definitions. See, the dictionary itself is not, it's some authority, but it's weak compared to case law. It's weak compared to black letter law. But, uh, it's useful, you know, it, it, it gives you an idea, but they, they, they put the cases in. The beautiful part about the seventh uh, edition, which the attorneys really, really hated, and that's why the sixth edition continues to be published, or maybe they came out with the eighth now, and that is that the seventh, they, they thought it would be a grand idea to strip out all the case law. So you'd get a definition, but no case law. I think I got my versions right. One of those versions, they stripped it out, and it didn't sell well. <laughs> a lot of attorneys were very much, much offended by the fact that there was no case law included in the definitions. But it's all part of trying to keep them in the dark so the power structure can have more flexibility. But anyhow, you see there's no statutes in common law. Now, how can we make this work? Well, uh, you see, if you look at, at the Constitution of California, 
I'm talking about the 1879 Constitution. That's the one that was never approved by Congress, but was voted in by the citizens of the United States. The Constitution, the 1879 Constitution, requires or defines all the courts in California as courts of record. Okay? Well, that means all the courts are supposed to be proceeding according to the common law. So this is why they ha uh, uh, well, I'll get into that in a moment. But you see, if you're proceeding according to the common law, there are no statutes. So how do they have all these statutes and lay them on you? Well, I'll tell you that secret in a moment. But I have to finish up this, this court of record. The last requirement is the real humdinger, the doozy. Number two, the tribunal is independent of the magistrate. The tribunal is the one who does the judging. The magistrate is the public officer on the payroll. Anytime you see a judge making a decision, you are not in a court of record. Only the tribunal can make decisions. If the judge uses his discretion, you're not in a court of record then if you allow it. You are in what's called a nisi prius court, or in other words, a court that exists because you failed to object. You, there were no prior objections, therefore you have a nisi prius court. And sure, you can be subject to anything the judge says if you don't ar uh, don't argue, don't object. <coughs> yes. So if it's not mentioned, you have to mention it up front. Failure to object means you agree. But if it's not brought up as a, as a subject, you object to it. You have to bring it up as a subject. Well, if you see them doing it, they they may not have brought it up with words, but if they bring it up with actions, right. you know, you got to object. Failure to object means you agree. Yes. In fact, uh, should you not object to anything and everything you can no. to secure even more? Well, basically, yeah, you can make a general objection. It's like one guy, he was in court, and the judge said to him, yeah, 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 I know, you object to everything. Well, thank you. He got the acknowledgement. He didn't need to object anymore. <laughs> no? Hey, you're on your own trip, but it's all reversible now, see? because the judge said he understood. He may, the judge thought he was being sarcastic, but you know what? Emotions don't show through on the transcripts. <laughs> Anybody wants to talk, come to the microphone. Well, this sure. Is, this is much more yeah, we have a microphone here, so if you want to say something, great, or we can transport it to you. It's got some length to the cord there. Anyhow, the tribunal is independent of the magistrate. No decisions are allowed. That's why it is when, it, when a judge makes a decision, since I'm the sovereign of the court, you know, the court's the person in suit of the sovereign. Here I am. I own the court. I hire the judge to work for me. It's a court of record. He has no discretion. He cannot make any decisions. Furthermore, whatever he does, if you go to, um, if you go to uh, uh, Blackstone's commentaries, here, I think I find it fast. No, it's not there. Okay. Well, <coughs> in Blackstone's commentaries, uh, the, um, the judge is the mirror of the sovereign. Okay? Make a decision unless he knows that's how the sovereign's going to decide. He has to be the, the sovereign's mirror. Okay, well anyway, that's, <coughs> that's what a court of record is. So we operate in a court of record. Uh, understand that if you're the defendant, you're not the sovereign. All this stuff I'm talking about that sovereigns do, you cannot do as a defendant, okay? You're in a case, you're a defendant, don't you dare issue any orders because you will be in contempt of court. That will be a misdemeanor. You will be subject to whatever they put on you. Okay, so if you are find yourself to be a defendant and you want to exercise these uh, rights and powers, you're first to convert yourself out of the status of defendant into the plaintiff, and that's what a counterclaim does for you. The foundation of a counterclaim is jurisdiction. You are challenging jurisdiction under the rules of equity as well as the rules of of in law are that any time jurisdiction is challenged, 
the plaintiff, the burden of proof falls on the plaintiff to provide the proof that he has the jurisdiction. Jurisdiction cannot be assumed. Okay. Okay. So you do a counterclaim, you say, where's the jurisdiction? You have no jurisdiction, you can put in whatever you want in your counterclaim, and you ask for it. And if they have no jurisdiction, obviously you've been injured. Your rights have been taken from you. And, and if you have an injury, you claim damages for that exceeding the jurisdiction. Okay? Back again, if, some, if the government violates your rights, what do you do? You say, hey, you guys, you, it's a chain of events. You guys exceeded your jurisdiction, so the consequence of that, the next link in the chain is that I was injured, and the next link in the chain is I want damages for my injury. Okay? All right, so that's the court of record. Enough of that. <coughs> you now know, I hope. Okay. So, <clears throat> a brief word about habeas corpus. By my research, and I, there are people who have argued with me, somewhat half successfully, so, <coughs> but nevertheless, my position is that the sovereign is always, without exception, always subject to his own court. Stand by for a uh, tape break. <clears throat>
it would decide what to do about the case. Well, bureaucrats, you know, bureaucrats actually are a very um, uh, corporate politics oriented group. And they love to do each other in. I mean, gaining a point on the, on the competition is always fun for bureaucrats. They have nothing else to do, really. And so <coughs> this habeas corpus became a tool for territorial protection. And so when somebody came, and if that somebody was not the common enemy of both courts, often what they do is they would tell the first court, look, this is not in your jurisdiction. You don't know what you're doing. This case shouldn't have been in your place. They dismiss the case and let the guy go. And the habeas corpus is the only known right that grew stronger with time. Because habeas corpus, the primary purpose was not to get a determination if you were, I, I, of your rights. The real purpose was territorial protection by the bureaucrats. Okay? And so they would get, they, uh, it became known as the great writ of liberty. But that was what was really going on behind the scenes. Well, now you're a sovereign. You're always subject to your own court. And by the way, be very careful who you hire into your court for that reason. But you're subject to your own court. Now, the only way anybody can get jurisdiction over you is if they can produce an injured party, injured body, right? Corpus delicti. If they can produce the corpus delicti, well, then uh, obviously they get jurisdiction. That, that's the fundamental of jurisdiction. Well, what habeas corpus is here in America, you're sovereign, you're subject to your own court. So you complain to your own court. You petition your own court for habeas corpus. You're saying, hey, I don't belong in that court. I belong in this court, the one that has jurisdiction over me already. And so your court pulls over this other court stuff, looks at it, and says, where's the injured party? You send out the notice. You say, all right, you guys, why are you taking jurisdiction? What's going on? You have three days to answer. OK? They come back. If they don't prov provide a satisfactory answer, case is gone. You start issuing orders, dismissing. OK? So it's your court versus their court. Remember, habeas corpus is not a legal proceeding. Okay? Sure, it may be subject, the way things are handled is like in the Code of Civil Procedure or the, you know, the uh, United States Civil Code, um, Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. The, it's not a legal proceeding at all. What it is is it's a family fight between courts trying to figure out who has jurisdiction. That's why it's so simple. You think they want to throw all that load on themselves, making up paperwork the right way? <laughs> That's why the, the paperwork's so simple. It's a family fight between courts. And once the family settles who's got jurisdiction of this area, then they move on. But that's what, when you do a habeas corpus, if you are in your sovereign capacity and you, you move for habeas corpus in a court of record, you outrank the other courts and you can issue orders if they fail. And you know what's interesting is that whenever I file a habeas corpus, they never answer. You notice that? Because generally they can get away with it with not answering. They probably make a phone call to the judge and saying, hey, what's going on here? What are you going to do? The judge says, don't worry about it. Take care of it. OK? That's probably what actually happens. That's the informal system behind the real system. OK? But uh, when you start issuing orders, that's going to surprise them. You ever notice you put in a habeas corpus, nothing happens for months, and then suddenly they come through with an order denying it? You know why? Well, they didn't issue the answer. But that isn't why they waited. What they were waiting for you to do something. They were waiting for you to move your own court. You didn't. So obviously, under parents patria rules, everybody know what parents patria is? That's, that's the, pa the, the patronage or the parentage of the government, the king, over the citizen. If you don't know what you're doing, you're obviously not competent, so the king steps in and takes care of you. Yeah. Or in other words, you didn't do anything, you didn't move your court, so they move for you. They issue the orders. That's why they wait all that time. The rules say you've got to be three days. 
they have to answer and then five days have a hearing, they don't do it. They're waiting for you to do it. You've got to issue those orders. Okay? It's your court. By what authority do they assume? Now, when I put my papers in, I don't explain to them that they have to produce an injured body. What I do is I put in my habeas corpus papers, I say, I don't know why they're attacking me. I let them figure it out what the requirements are. And then, if they don't come up with it, then I make the ruling. By then, it's too late for them to answer, if they did answer in the first place. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so that's a little bit about habeas cor corpus. Uh, finally, the, na the last thing, yeah, I'm skimming over this pretty fast because I just wanted to get those fundamentals down before we get into the, uh, the motion stuff. All right, now, uh, Magna Carta, okay? We have, if you look, yes. Well, first of all, we haven't had any real luck with it. Uh, <clears throat> we've been able to, like, shock them, and then they, they, it takes them time to figure out what to do next. Wait, 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 the you did have luck. I did it, and it worked. Oh, you did it, and it worked? Yeah, I talked to the aliens and what to do. They said, Michael over Trump. to the telegraph court. I went over to the telegraph court. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Get on the microphone. <laughs> microphone. Uh, now, please put on the microphone. Okay, so you, you and I talked about this, and... Right. and is a switch on? Is there a switch on there? No switch? Is the mic on? <coughs> Is the microphone on? We're checking now. Go ahead and talk. Hello? Hello? Yes. Wait a minute. Hello? No, can One, two. Now. Hello? Yes. Okay. It was in San Marcos in uh, San Diego, North County. And um, I tried several different things. And I said, well, this isn't working, so I uh, Speak to the you. crowd. What's that? Speak louder so they can hear him back. OK. And so uh, I sent in the habeas corpus, and they gave up, sent it over to the appeals division, whatever that was. And uh, they told me where that was. And I went over there, and I said, OK, uh, where, where is the, um, the papers? They didn't have it. I said, well, file this. And what I did is make, made an order of the court, was one of the people, to dismiss the case mm -hmm. completely. And it's on the top. Now, she didn't take it and stamp it and file it. She said right. it stamped it with something received. I said, fine, put it in there. Right. Never heard of them again. That was about three years ago. OK, so it stopped them. We've been good at stopping people, but we haven't been doing good at collecting judgments and things. I'm sure we'll get there eventually, but at least we've stopped them. That's, that's the main thing that we, in, in other cases, not habeas corpus, but doing other <laughs> techniques, we've stopped them. They just like the case fades away. Yes, sir? No, it's not just a collection issue because, you know, if, if it's a judgment, and remember, a lot of the, this, this concept that I'm bringing in about being nice to everybody is, is a relatively new concept because in the past, people have not been nice. They've been angry upset because they're getting a raw deal and then of course they, they it just you nice know work. Nice, work. nice does work yes and and uh, so we haven't had good experience but what we have in these fights if you do get a judgment and you go to execute the judgment and by that time the sheriff is clued in and what the sheriff will do is if you have a writ of execution he calls up the guy and he says, you know, I've got to be out there at 2 o'clock. I've got this uh, judgment to enforce against you. Will you be there? Oh. And the guy says, yeah, I'll be here. Sure. And uh, so then the sheriff sends his deputy out. The deputy gets there. The guy's not there. He comes back. Oh, I couldn't find him. Okay? If they really wanted to find him, they could. But the point is, is that they're, put, they're, they're pitting form against substance. And the idea is, is that, yeah, we went out there. We tried to collect it, but we couldn't find the guy, you know. So your, your judgment lies uncollected. And then the other thing is, is some people get these billion dollar uh, uh, judgments against the city of, uh, let's say, Redondo Beach or something. Well, everybody looks at that as just being crazy. They don't take you seriously. That's bad image. You'd do much better with 50 or or $100,000 than you would with a billion. 
Okay? I know it, you, you, you got a billion dollars worth of pain, but the fact is, is that you got to put on a good show for the rest of the world. Okay. Anyhow, you see, the Constitution of the United States guarantees the common law is available to you. You have the Seventh Amendment is one place. Article 3, Section 2 says that the judicial power of the United States is uh, available to all cases in law and equity. Well, in law means common law, okay? Statutes are actually equity. So <coughs> the, uh, uh, the judicial power is available. So they recognize it. The, the government recognizes common law. So if you have a common law proceeding, you put on a good show, you run it right, they will back you up. Perhaps reluctantly, but they'll back you up. But uh, there, the, we, haven't, we haven't reached the level of acceptance because of, frankly, ignorance. Ignorance is everywhere, in government and out. So we haven't got that automatic acceptance like a judge has when he signs an order. So, but we're working on it with time. But we have to, we have to get that acceptance. It, there's more to law than just law, okay? You've got to get the cooperation of other people. Now, but you see, the Constitution does acknowledge and does back, provide backup force, in other words, behind common law. So what is common law? Well, if you ask any attorney, he'll t the school teaches him that common law is the case law, okay? <clears throat> and that's about 1% of it. You know, that's true, but it, it's just a small percentage. Common law is actually public opinion. It's anything you can get a jury to agree to, okay? And in the absence of a jury, it's anything the sovereign says, okay? It's the sovereign's law. And... Uh, <clears throat> so you, you run your, your case under common law, and if you look at the California Constitution, the California Constitution says all courts are courts of record. Well, if they're all courts of record, they should all be run according to the common law, right? So uh, if you see you're in statutory law, how do they get the statutory law? Let me explain it. What they do, you see in a normal case at law, a civil case, you make the accusation, the other person is automatically guilty unless he proves his innocence. We know this is so because if he doesn't answer, we find him guilty and he gets the judgment default. Okay? So you are guilty until proven innocent in a civil court. So <clears throat> the government has a special limitation. They are required to consider you innocent until you're proven guilty. Not only that, but they cannot proceed without you. They have to get personal jurisdiction over you before they can proceed against you. So what they do is they arrest you and they bring you in they, and, and they, they have this little thing called an arraignment. Why do they have arraignment? The reason is is because they are securing your agreement to a court not of record. Okay? They say to you, you are accused of violating statute or code such and such. Not common law, but code. How do you plead? Do you plead that it's a valid statute, but you're not guilty? Do you plead it's a valid statute, but you are guilty? Or do you plead it's a valid statute and no contest? Okay, in all cases, you're pleading it's a valid statute. Now, they don't say that. All they say is you're accused of violating it, and if you take the bait and give them a, a guilty, not guilty, or no contest, you have automatically agreed to the validity of the jurisdiction. Okay, the code. The fourth choice they never tell you, which is I demand a common law court. I demand proceeding a common law in accordance with California Constitution, Article 6, Paragraph 1. Okay? And so that's how it's right there. But you have a primary right to contract. So they contract you into an alternative system. Okay? So now, just exactly what is the common law? Well, again, all the attorneys are taught that common law is case law. But let's take a look here. In truth, common law is generally understood by everybody that not only is it case law, but it's also the common law of England as it was in 1776 when we declared our independence. Okay? And the Constitution recognizes the common law. But <clears throat> it's still unwritten. Now, what does unwritten mean? Unwritten does not mean that it's not written. What it means is that there is no 
common pinpoint source where you can find the common law defined. Okay? If you look at statutory law, it's real easy with statutory law. You just go to the legislative record, you show there, that's where it came from. There's a procedure followed. Common law doesn't work that way. Basically, the sovereign decrees whatever he thinks <coughs> the, lo the law is, and if public opinion agrees, that's the common law. Okay? So, bureaucrats do not particularly understand common law. Okay? So, you've got to give them something to get their teeth into, because everything has to be in writing. You know, that's how bureaucrats are. So how do you put it in writing? Well, it turns out <coughs> that we had this little thing called the Confirmatio Cartarum. Now what happened was the Magna Carta came along. Magna Carta basically put some limitations on King John. They basically told him, look, you know, sign this or we'll cut your head off. So <laughs> he signed it. <laughs> and the Pope blessed it. But about a year later, uh, the Pope died and King John died. It was a remarkable coincidence. They were died within like about three months of each other, three, four months. And they created a power vacuum in the religious side, and they created a power vacuum on the king's side, but the noblemen were still organized. They had no power vacuum. So the first thing they, they understood, you know, they're smart, and they went, they immediately went to the new king who had not yet established his power base, and they got him to recertify the Magna Carta. And every king after that recertified it to some degree or other with some minor modifications. And uh, so that, that's how the Magna Carta was kept alive and it grew stronger with time. Well, <coughs> King Edward I came along and he was likewise weak and the demands were made on him to recertify it. <coughs> so he came up with this document called the Confirmatio Cartarum. It's up there on the screen. Here. Now it's a little bigger, I think. It'll be a little bigger. <coughs> there, now can you read it? Yeah. Okay. Come from out to Qatarm. And <coughs> this is really a, a neat little item. Yep. Okay. And <coughs> right here, this is the king speaking. Okay. And he says in the Confirmatio Cartarum, we have confirmed them in all points, and that our justices, sheriffs, mayors, and other ministers, which under us have the laws of our land to guide, shall allow the said charters pleaded before them in judgment in all their points. That is, to wit, the great charter as the common law, and the charter of the forest for the wealth of our realm. So the great charter, that's the Magna Carta, another name for Magna Carta. The Magna Carta is the common law. But notice what it says. It says that all of these king's officers shall allow them pleaded. In other words, you don't have to use the common, the uh, Magna Carta, but if you choose to call the Magna Carta the common law, the officials must accept it as such. Okay? So it's optional with you whether or not it's common law. But they have to take it if you demand it. Okay, so that is the great connection. <coughs> That's the connection between the Constitution and the Magna Carta, is the, is the Confirmatio Cartarum. Believe it or not, I found this in a Bar Association law book. <coughs> I think I give the credit at the end of the article. But the Magna Carta is the common law. Magna Carta is good law in the United States especially if you as a sovereign decree it so. Okay? And in my papers, you'll see I decree it so. All right, so that's the Confirmatio Cartarum, and from there we go to the Magna Carta. And the Magna Carta has uh, a variety of things that are kind of handy. Uh, the one that I'm looking forward to uh, uh, developing sometime in the future is Article 61. I love Article 61. This is the best article in the whole thing, I think. Article 61 defines the procedure for, a, uh, for setting up <coughs> and running a grand jury. That's a real grand jury. I want you to notice something. 
The Magna Carta specifies specifically 25 members of the nobility are the grand jury. Okay? 25 people. We are all grand jurors, potentially. We are people. I hope we're all people in here. Okay? Do we have 25 in here? We have enough for a grand jury? <laughs> Twenty-five exactly. Boy, we can tear up the landscape here, the legal landscape. Okay. <coughs> Not citizens. See, you know you're entitled to a jury of your peers. What's the definition of a peer? You ever thought about that? Who knows what the definition of a peer is? Anybody? Member of the peerage. Member of the peerage, right. What's the peerage? That's the nobility. In America, in America, before we created citizens of the United States with the 14th Amendment, everybody was a peer unless he was a slave or an Indian. Okay? So everybody was a peer. Today, regardless of color, everybody is a peer. Okay? Because we prohibited d discrimination. So we're all peers. We're members of the peerage. So when you're, you're entitled to a jury of your peers, that means somebody who knows he's a sovereign. And there was a case in San Diego about 10 years ago or so. I wish I'd followed up so I could cite it and tell you exactly what it was, but I didn't. I was too innocent at the time to appreciate this. But this guy demanded a jury of his peers, real peers. And there was not a single person in the jury pool who would admit that he wasn't a citizen of the United States. <laughs> they all insisted that they were subjects, right? Subject to the jurisdiction. Well, that's not a peer. So finally, the judge ordered the sheriff to go out and gather up some peers, okay? Because that the sheriff's authorized to bring in people, if necessary, arrest them for jury duty, okay? <laughs> he could not find a single person, and he had to report back to the court. He couldn't find any peers. So they had to dismiss the case. They couldn't <laughs> proceed because it was a right to have a jury of peers. Wow. <laughs> but notice this, that it consists of 25 when you read the article. And um, the thing is, is that, in fact, here it is. <coughs> right here it mentions 25, right there uh, <coughs> in the article. You'll notice that all the grand juries in the United States consist of fewer than 25. They're 23, 21, even as few as 17, okay? Why? Well, it's because they have no real legal power, no lawful power. They have legal power, but not lawful power. Legal means statutory form, <laughs> lawful means substance and common law. They have no real authority. And I remember the Orange County Grand Jury uh, did uh, a report on the data processing department of Orange County. And it was rather scathing report about how sloppy they were, unorganized, and so on, you know. And uh, I remember one of the supervisors saying, well, you know, that's the grand jury's opinion, but they don't know, they don't really know what's going on and what's happening with data processing, you know. That was his position. He couldn't have said that with a grand jury of 25. And I'll tell you something else that's not well known. If you look up, if you look up in the code somewhere relating to grand juries, I don't remember where it is, but I know it's there. A grand jury can remove anyone from op elected office. Really? It's in there somewhere. Really? Put a grand jury together. <laughs> yeah. Right now. Yes. Are you saying that a grand jury to be lawful must have 25 people? So that all these if grand juries are fewer than five people are. We can just vote now. Kind of blowing in the wind. They're bogus. And we move Bush. They're accepted. <laughs> they're followed. But when push comes to shove, as the supervisor said, well, they really don't know what what's going on. They they you know. They just don't understand. He wasn't going to change anything in the data processing department. Yes, sir, you were saying? I said, you mean tell me we can uh, settle this issue with Bush and, and, and uh, vote him out of office now in this 
rules? I'm talking about California rules. Oh, California rules. Right. I don't know how it works federally. I don't know, but mm. but it's interesting. Just as a little, to just to give you a taste of the power of a grand jury, it tells you right here that. It says here that, uh, right here, okay, and here it is, starts here, okay, and it goes down to uh, let's see, it goes down a ways wherever the end of the sentence is, right here, okay. Yeah, this is all good stuff right down to here. Yeah, even this. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. But basically, here's what it says. It says basically, <clears throat> all right, if we are justice or our bailiffs or any one of our servants shall have transgressed against anyone in any respect or shall have broken some one of the articles of peace or security and our transgression shall have been shown to forbearance of the aforesaid 25, those four barons shall come to us, meaning the king and his staff, or if we are abroad to our justice, meaning their judges, of course, showing to us our error, and they shall ask us to cause that error to be amended without delay. And if we do not amend that error, or we being abroad, if our justice do not amend it within a term of 40 days from the time when it is shown to us, or we being abroad to our justice, the aforesaid four barons shall refer the matter to the remainder of the 25 barons. And those 25 barons, with the whole land in common, shall distrain and oppress us in every way in their power, namely by taking our castles, lands, and possessions, and in every other way they can, until amends shall have been made according to their judgment, saving the persons of ourselves, our queen, and our children. In other words, you can't kill the kids. You can't kill the king and queen. You can't put them in jail. Okay? So you can't touch them personally, but you can take all their properties. Okay? And when amends shall have been made, they shall be in accord with us, as they had been previously, right? Got to be in accord with us. So the grand jury decides when the fight's over. No one else. There's no other authority. Okay? The grand jury is the sole judge as to when this problem is fixed or whether it's fixed. And when men, amends shall have been made, they shall be in accord with us <coughs> as they had been previously. And whoever of the land wishes to do so shall swear that in carrying out all the aforesaid <coughs> measures, he will obey the mandates of the aforesaid 25 barons, and that with them he will oppress us to the extent of his power. In other words, the king is pre-approving anybody who wants to help the grand jury go against the king. Okay, it's pre-approved. Yes, sir? If you go into a court demanding common law, court and demand the common law trial and ask for a grand jury and they can't provide peers, can you provide your own? If the court will accept it, I'm assuming you're a defendant. But my question... No, I, I never walk into the court as a defendant. Pardon? I would never walk into court as a defendant. Well, then why would you be asking that question? Huh? Why well, would you be asking... To bring a... Uh, um, uh, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. If you're the plaintiff, like in a counterclaim, if you're the counter plaintiff, yeah. you own the court. Why would you want to dilute your authority with a jury? Let the defense ask for a jury if that's what they want. And usually they don't because then they know they're cooked because they're usually very unjust in the issues we handle typically. See? But, you know, look at traffic court. <coughs> traffic court, they secure your agreement for the Nisi Prius court. In other words, not a court of record. And they run it guilty until proven innocent, right? You've seen it. That's how it should be. I know, judge does the prosecuting. Okay, well, that's, that's the, uh, a little bit of Magna Carta. Would you define baron? A baron? Well, that's one of the class of, uh, of nobility. Um, let's see. I think if we... Uh, uh, somewhere in here, that's not the subject for today, but somewhere in here I provide to you a list of the ranks of nobility in England. I don't know where it is. It's somewhere on here. Anyhow, <clears throat> all right. So 
that pretty well covers the overview. Did they break that? Yeah. Well, uh, lunch is at 12, and it's 12. <laughs> yeah, I know it. I bore you so. Time just <coughs> drags on. <coughs> yeah. Well, you mentioned that you're going to mail the CD. Are we are we through recording? Okay, let's take a break. All right, everybody, would you please? Is dazzle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to talk about motions, and uh, <coughs> so. Uh, going back to the main website, uh, let's see, here we are. What is that? Yeah, well, it's actually a program on the computer called Dazzle. So, right, it's kind of a neat one. Okay, so we'll go back to uh, procedure, okay? Now, what I'm going to talk about <coughs> is motions and this is going to be about the form of motions, okay? I'm not going to get into substance. There's many different kinds of motions, and whatever there are, I'm not going to talk about those. What I'm just going to talk about is the form of motions, how the paperwork should be assembled, what it should look like, and so forth. But once you understand motions, you can do just about anything with a motion. Yes? Uh, it will be. Right now it's not. It's on the CD. <coughs> but I will be putting this up I, because now I've modified it. The CD pretty much parallels the, uh, the website. Um, some things I don't have on the website, like for instance, Title 26, Title 28, Title 18, you know, those things. I don't have those on there because you get them on the internet anyway. <coughs> you know, th those are publicly available. But, yes. Neither do I. I don't. I don't publish the foot head notes and footnotes either. Okay, not really. But uh, I've got these things off the internet. That's where they came from. So I know it's available. Well, I'm gonna. Uh, I'm gonna start working on that right away. I suppose I'll. I'll have them mailed out by Friday. I'm sure. Yeah. So. Anyhow, <coughs> okay, well, anyhow, we have the, uh, we're, we're going to talk about the form of motions. Now, here's the thing. We have, here you are, here you are, here I am. If I want something from you, I ask, right? I just, whatever, I can ask any question. Whether I get the answer I like is a whole no another possibility. But the fact is, is that if I want something from you, I ask you. Uh, I don't have it. Okay. Yeah. I oh. And part of it is the air conditioning. The yeah, fans are there. Okay. But is that a little better? Is that a little better now? Okay. A little bit of a ring there, but I guess a little feedback, but we're okay. All right. So with motions, <coughs> when motions, basically all a motion is is it's a letter you write to the court asking the court for a decision. The first motion that you write is not called a motion at all. It's called a complaint. Okay? But the idea is basically the same. You write a letter to the court and you ask the court for whatever you want and then the court responds. And then, of course, in fairness, the other person gets a chance to respond to whatever your motion is. So there's a procedure to follow. But every motion has five basic points, okay, <coughs> or, five, or, or five basic papers that are required. So the first one is a notice of motion. It's a little unfair for me to make a motion to the court and not tell you about it if, you're, if you have an interest in it. Yes, sir? What's the difference between the original motion and the petition? Nothing. <coughs> <coughs> See, there's only two kinds of paper. There's only one kind of paper when you get right down to it. It's called, you know, in, in substance, it's a motion. You're asking the court for something, and the court's going to respond with a yay or nay. But the first paper that you file in, the first motion you put in, is called a complaint or an action in law. After that, you have, <coughs> you make motions, 
And some motions are very specialized, like you have a motion to quash, you have a motion for reconsideration, you have a motion to vacate judgment, you know, but it all boils down to the very same thing, and that is that you're presenting a question to the court and you want the, an answer from the court, yay or nay. And of course, as I discussed earlier today, you'd like to have the right decision come back, and so it's good for you to be in charge. You know, make it your court when you make that motion. But the, the idea is that you're writing a letter to the judge, or not the judge, I mean to the court, and you want that court to come back with an answer. And of course, you're fighting for your side. So you have to, you need to format these things correctly. And there's a standard way to format it. And if you do this, it makes it a lot easier for everyone else because everyone else is looking for you to format it that way. And if you do it that way, then it's easier for them to absorb what you're getting at when you're getting at it. So, <clears throat> but the first thing is you gotta put in a notice of a motion. Hey everybody, I'm gonna ask the court this question, be there or be square, <clears throat> okay? So, the, that's what the notice is for, exactly that, giving notice to everybody. Then you make the actual motion. You go to the court and you say, well, <clears throat> this is what I want, okay? Well, of course, if that's all you do, the logical thing the court's going to do is say, well, okay, you want it, but why should we give it to you? Okay? So then you bring in two other items. One item you bring in is called facts. Okay? What are the facts in this that, that, that surround this problem? And then the other thing you bring in is, well, what are the rules of the game? What laws are there? Or if you don't have any laws, what philosophies you have, or something, you know, some authority that, that the court can, can look at and say, oh, okay, that makes sense. All right, so you put the two together, but if you just present the facts in the form of an affidavit, and you just present the law in the form of, uh, of authorities, that's not enough. <coughs> Basically, if, you, if that's all you do, you're asking the person, court or anybody else that you present it to, if that's all you do, you're asking them to do your thinking for you. And you want to do their thinking for them. It's much better that way. So you, in, your, in your paper, you include also your argument. Why is it? How do the, how do the uh, rules of the game combine with the facts of the matter come together in order to deliver to you the very thing you want out of the court. That's called argument. Okay, so we have argument. That's the C there. <coughs> now, <coughs> it's true that you put together a notice, you put together a motion, you put together your points and authority, and you file it with the court, but how does the court know that although you have the notice motion and affidavit and points of authorities, how does the court know that the other side got proper notice? So you've got to put in a paper with the court telling the court that yes indeed everybody got a copy and that's called a proof of service. So now the court knows that well you were polite, you were fair, you gave them their notice, now the court doesn't care if they don't respond. But if you put in a motion Without a proof of service, the court is very much concerned that this is a one-sided deal, okay? So they, they want you to notify other people. All right, and then you have <coughs> a proposed order. Now, the rules of court, if you look at the federal rules of civil procedure, and I believe it's also in the state rules, but I'm not sure, attorneys are prohibited from submitting, um, submitting proposed orders. Okay, they may not do this unless they get the court's permission. Okay, there's a very good reason for that. Attorneys are not sovereigns. They are officers of the court. Their job, in fact their primary job, their primary duty is to the court. Their secondary duty is to their clients. Okay, and by the way, you'll find that in uh, uh, American jurisprudence, AMJUR. 
I don't know his first, second, or maybe all, maybe all three of them. But <clears throat> you look up an attorney, you'll find out that an attorney's first duty is to the court, second duty is to the client. Okay? So that the, he's an officer of the court. The theory is, and this of course doesn't work, but the theory is is that all of these attorneys are actually counselors and they are all have a common interest that is to seek the truth. <coughs> right, right. <coughs> well, I tried to warn you. But, <coughs> but that's, that's the theory, okay? So, uh, but you see, attorneys, attorneys are not the interested parties. They are merely representatives or they are court officers, but they're not the interested parties. And because they're not the interested parties, they really don't qualify to decide what orders should be or not be. Now, if you're not an attorney, you definitely can put in a proposed order. But if you're an attorney, you're prohibited from it. Usually what happens is when the, when the court renders a decision, uh, they also instruct one of the attorneys to write it up. Usually the winning side writes it up. And well, that's fine. They can do it if the court instructs them to do it. But other than that, they cannot. Anybody here know what the word render means? I used it just now. What does render mean? We say the court renders a decision. <laughs> it's not a decision at all. It's a proposed decision. Okay? There are cases where that got appealed where the judge issued a decision, but when the decision actually got on paper, it went the other way. And it got appealed, and the Supreme Courts have said a decision's not a decision until it's on paper and signed, okay? And as long as we're on the subject of decisions, anybody know what a minute order is? <clears throat> why do we have minute orders? Anybody know why we have minute orders, what they are? You see them all the time. Hmm? Is it conclusion of law from the judge? No, it's not a conclusion of law from the judge. <laughs> it's not a decision. It's not an order. It's not the ruling either. It's an accounting of the day's procedure. Not even that. <clears throat> a minute order is not part of the record. A, what it is is that you have to look back in your court history to understand this. Back in the good old days, <clears throat> several hundred years ago, all opinions or decisions of the court were written in a large hand, great big letters on the paper, and delivered to the parties. It was written in large hand. The clerk kept, a, uh, kept notes of the of the court procedure. Those notes were written in a small hand, minute hand, okay? So minutes of the clerk or minute handwriting is merely notes of the clerk and have no legal standing, <clears throat> okay? No legal standing. Now, all these courts are issuing minute orders when they issue it. Do you have a, can you have a clue why they issue minute orders instead of an actual order? Well, I'll tell you why. <clears throat> I'll tell you why. The California Constitution requires that all courts in California be courts of record. Now, you know what a court of record is, right? We went through the five requirements. Now, but they're conducting courts not of record. True, they're keeping a record, but they don't meet the qualification for that term of art, court of record. So how can they have a, a court not of record without violating a court of record, okay? Well, what they do is they issue minute orders. And since nobody understands what a minute order is, that it's merely the clerk's minutes, because see, a, clerk, a judge can act as a clerk if he chooses, all right? Since nobody understands <coughs> that minute orders, what they are, all they know is they're in court, the judge said do this, he issues a minute order, 
and they all accept it, not knowing that it's not the real thing. Okay? And of course, if, they, if somebody violates the minute order, they can be uh, persecuted as well as prosecuted for contempt of court, but it's only because nobody understands that that minute order is not a real order. Okay? And this is, this is uh, some of you have heard of that case the, uh, the other day where we put in a notice to uh, the sheriff and some other people that the minute order issued by an order was an order without jurisdiction. And that was the reason why, because it's not came, it, it was not a court of record. It could not have been issued by a court of record. It was a decision purely uh, out of a Nisi Prius court, accepting that it wasn't even a Nisi Prius court because, after all, the person did object. So, there you are. So, anyway, that enough of that. So let's go back here. So that's the overview of a motion. And there's a seventh item here, which is after the order has, is produced by the court, then the winning party typically sends out a notice or the clerk can send out a notice to all the parties saying what that decision was. So it's called a notice. And of course, a notice of, of ruling is exact, exactly the same format as a notice of motion. It's just that we're saying what the decision was. So let's take them one by one. Let's talk about first what the notice looks like. Here is a notice, okay? It has, uh, it, it has a format that you're all familiar with. <coughs> all right, what's going on here? Try this again. Press the top button. Which top button? Okay, the one you have in the back one. Try that again. Cancel and push the top. Up here? No, no click the notice of motion again. Right here. Right. Okay. Oh, there it is. You're right. You got it. Right. <coughs> okay. <coughs> this is supposed to go. I hear it spinning up. Here it goes. It's a Microsoft Word file. Sorry, didn't mean to advertise Microsoft. <coughs> okay, now this, this is a notice of motion that, that actually came out of a case. Okay. Um, I had a, a case here. Now, here was my problem. <coughs> Some people had, had, were taking care of my dad, and when his mind was failing him, they got him to sign away the, the title to his home. Okay? It's, that's, uh, there's a name for that. It's called undue influence. Okay? And normally, undue influence is an equity issue. <coughs> but nevertheless, this happened. So I decided to sue some people, and we had some complications along the way. Well, there was, we arrived at a point where he passed away. So when that happened, since he was the plaintiff in the case, normally a case dies. Okay? That's it. Unless it involves property. If it involves property, then the case can continue, but you have to find a substitute plaintiff. Who's going to step in for the old plaintiff? <coughs> Well, since I was the logical heir to the property, and I was also um, present at all times when the offenses occurred against my dad, like for instance, when the nurse came to take care of him, the property manager of the mobile home park came out screaming at the nurse, telling her she shouldn't be here, stuff like that. Really unreasonable people, I think. So <clears throat> anyhow, we had this lawsuit going, and now what I wanted to do is I wanted to become the new plaintiff. So there was no plaintiff. <coughs> so uh, they had issued a court order of some kind dismissing the case. But you see, you can't dismiss a case if there's no sovereign of the court. Right? What's the definition of court? Person in suit of the sovereign. Well, if the sovereign dies, you're left only with a suit. You can't do anything. No orders can logically or legally or lawfully be issued by the judges. But they did it anyway. So <clears throat> we had an attorney representing us. Uh, I did all the work and the attorney just signed the papers. 
and, uh, but he was very helpful and uh, very reasonable with his, his fees for, because of that. Really good guy, as a matter of fact. And uh, <clears throat> one of the few good attorneys I've ever met, actually. <laughs> But he, uh, uh, when, when the case was basically done from his point of view, and, and our cause basically was gone, but I had decided, well, heck, I think I'll just kind of continue on with it because I'm getting a legal education out of it. See? <laughs> so um, <coughs> the, uh, the, there was, the first thing I did is I had the attorney sign off of the case, and I sign on. That's the substitution of attorney. So I was actually the new attorney for the case, which is okay because I'm not representing anybody. You know, <laughs> the plaintiff is, is deceased, so it just has an attorney. But get this, I'm the only legitimate officer on the plaintiff's side of the case, on the king's side. So this motion here is a motion to add me on as a plaintiff, okay? But I think it really illustrates the principles involved here because this was done exactly according to book. So <coughs> here we have the first thing is a notice of motion. So <coughs> that's my name in the upper left hand corner. That's my old phone number. Don't call it. That person no longer is. I don't know who has a number now, but um, that's my old address. But anyhow, <coughs> so William C. Thornton was the, the prior plaintiff. And this is a notice of motion for substitution of plaintiff ex parte. Now, ex parte means without the other party present. Now, I was making this motion essentially ex parte, but as a courtesy, I was letting other people know. See, when you're ex parte, you don't have to let them know. Not necessarily. But if you let them know, it's kind of nice. And this was, you see, these were issues that weren't really key to them. But I still let them know. Anyway, <coughs> so um, it was ex parte, but there's really no difference between ex parte and a regular because the idea is, is you're giving notice to people, okay? And so we have these defendants. Now, I also want to tell you that when we sued, we had all these defendants. They did a countersuit, okay? And this, this um, heading that you see here shows the proper format for a counter suit or a counter claim or a counter complaint. Any of those terms, this is the proper format. You'll notice that on lines 10 through 15, it has the plaintiff and it has the defendant. Okay, that's your normal form. You've all seen that. And of course, always on line number eight, never any other line, you have the name of the court, Superior Court, right? All right. But in the counterclaim, this is a suit going the opposite direction. Same case number, but the opposite direction. And so right below the original caption, you have the other way caption. So this was Burl Gregory Enterprises cross-complaining against us and also cross-complaining against some of the other defendants. Basically, I think his original cross-complaint was that he didn't want to be held liable. He was trying to pass, if he did lose, he wanted to pass it through to the other defendant. That's what it amounted to. But anyway, that's the layout. In this case, he said cross complainant. If you do a counterclaim at, when you're at law, if you do a counterclaim, then where it says cross complainant, you would put counter plaintiff. Okay? And down below, they would be counter defendant. Okay, and now is another little side note, because <coughs> I like to throw these things in. Uh, let's say that uh, somebody throws a rock at, at, your, at you while you're driving your friend's car, okay, and you get injured. Okay, so you're going to sue the rock thrower, all right? Now, the owner of the car that you had borrowed says, ah, oh, I don't want to mess with it. And you're saying, well, come on, you should sue him because, you know, you're in it with me. I mean, it was your car, and if you sue too, your testimony and all that adds to my case, you know? So you should be there. And he says, no, nah, I don't want to bother with it. But what do you do when you have a reluctant co-plaintiff? Well, what you do is you add him to the suit. You make him a defendant, and you identify him as an uh, 
ad, uh, uh, what is it, a uh, adversarial co-plaintiff or something like that. What is it? Hostile. Hostile, hostile co-plaintiff, that would be it. See, so you're naming as a defendant, but you're saying, hey, you're coming into this suit whether you like it or not, okay? So that's how you can do that sometimes, and you can have fun with that. <coughs> so uh, I know that can be a problem sometimes that people won't cooperate when they really should. So just as you can subpoena witnesses in that don't want to testify and don't want to get involved, you can, you can bring in co-plaintiffs whether they like it or not. Okay, but anyway, that's the format for it. Now, typically, you have your case number, okay, and you have a notice of motion for substitution of plaintiff. Now, that little caption up there, uh, <coughs> sometimes clerks are very sensitive. If you call something by, by a notice or uh, a motion or whatever it is, you get these terms down right, they accept it. If, if you get the terms down wrong, they don't accept it. But here's a little hint. You can call it anything you want because the general rule of thumb is, is that titles don't count. <coughs> okay? What does count is what's in the body of the motion, the actual substance, the writings that you put in it. That's what counts. You could call it a motion to dismiss when it's actually a habeas corpus. Okay? So substance counts, but sometimes to get around clerks, you have to fiddle with the title. So that's what you do, okay? Because when you get right down to it, they're all motions. You're writing a letter to the court. Okay, so, and then typically, uh, where, where you see it says ex parte, a lot of times what that means is, um, not the ex parte, but that little spot, what you put in there is maybe you're doing something unusual that people might not recognize. So right there you put the code section that authorizes it. You'll see CCP something or other, or CC something, Code of, uh, code of Civil Procedure or the Civil Code, or Penal Code such and such. Penal Code authorizes it. So if you are using the statutes or you are using the codes, if you put the specific code right in that little space where it says ex parte, uh, that within the parenthesis, then people know that you've got some legitimacy there, even though it's unusual, okay? And then they can look it up themselves. So just the whole concept, the whole idea of that top part of the paper is just to make things easier for people to get focused on what you're doing. That's the idea. Now, none of it affects you. What only affects you is the body, what you put in the body. But this helps the reader. You're trying to communicate, and this helps to clarify things for people. Okay, then typically, when you go up to the window and you say, I want to make a motion, you get a date from the clerk. Now, different courts have different policies. Some courts say, come on in, file all your paperwork, come back later with the proof of service when you serve them, but we'll give you a date when you do that. Others say, Call us first on the phone, we'll assign you a date, and then show up with the paperwork. Others say, we don't want to hear from you. Just show up on a certain date. We have a standard date. Every Thursday at 1 p.m., we hear motions. Just walk in. So what the court does depends on which court you're in. So you've got to find the clerk, find out what's the procedure for pick getting a date. Okay. Um, uh, also, another thing is, is that how many of you have been told, I'm sorry, sir, or I'm a sorry, ma'am, but we cannot give you legal advice? You ever heard that? All the, All the time. The reason they're giving that to you is because you're asking the wrong, you're asking the right questions, but in the wrong way. Okay? What you should say whenever you go to a clerk or anybody of that kind, you say to them, not what should I do. You say to them, what do you require? As soon as you say, what do you require, you've eliminated their responsibility. Now they can speak freely. Okay? You will hear that reject notice less often if you say, what is it that you require? They'll say, oh, I can't take this. I don't say, why don't, won't you take it? 
what I say is, well, what are your requirements? And then they feel free to speak. Because if you look at the rules of court, now I can't... speak for every court, but I do know that in the Orange County Superior Court, the clerks are specifically instructed to be helpful. Okay, It is their job, and it's in the rules, it is their job to help you, not to advise you. Okay, So what's the difference between being helpful and advising? Well, it's the difference between what should I do and what are your requirements. Okay. So make sure you ask the question. It's not what you ask, it's how you ask it. Okay? All right, so anyway, typically you get the date, you get the department it's going to be heard in, and you get the name of the judge. That's typically, and you put just right there those three little lines, and that and you put that on all your paperwork for that specific motion. That helps to orient people. Now this here, of course, is just a notice of motion. Okay, so that's what it says. And here's the notice of the motion: To all interested parties, please take notice in the above entitled court that on January 15, 1987, at 1 p.m. or as soon thereafter as the matter may be heard in Department 430 of this court, located at 125 Seventh Drive, Santa Ana, California, William R. Thornton will and hereby does move for an order substituting the plaintiff in this action. And then sign it as a petitioner. <coughs> okay, that's it. It's just a notice. Just saying, that here's just a brief statement. This does not have to be legally correct. Okay? Because you're not asking anything, you're just... Pay attention. Now, as a matter of writing technique, I want you to notice that to all interested parties, please take notice. It's all capital letters. Okay? The rest is in upper and lower case. Why is that? Well, <clears throat> I cannot give you any, any good reason that you can check. Okay? So all I'm going to give you is hearsay as to why that's done. But I've seen it on a lot of papers that they open up with with capital letters. But I was talking with a person one time who said that he had been in Washington, D.C., and he went to some court in Washington, D.C., and he filed a paper up there, and the clerk told him that they couldn't accept it. And then the clerk paused and looked at it and said, oh, it's in all capitals. Now we have to listen. That's all I can tell you about what the story I heard, okay? But you think about it. It's true. All caps is yelling on paper. Okay? And what did the town crier go do back in the old days? Because a lot of this stuff is based on ancient custom. The town crier went down <coughs> through the town ringing his bell, 12 o'clock and all's well. <coughs> or else he had some news notice that the neighborhood should know about. They had town criers back in, in uh, olden days. Okay? So you yell at the person. You say, hey, wake up. i got to say this to you. Listen. That's all caps. And then you speak in ordinary tones, because now you, you should have their attention. And they can't say they didn't know because you yelled at them. <clears throat> That's my off-the-cuff theory on it, okay? But I, it is a fact. You look at papers, and they do have all caps on them, you know, in that first opening line a lot of times. Yes? Caps means conspicuously different. Caps means conspicuously different. Okay. Well, it certainly is. Sure, why not? It doesn't affect my rights, you know, because since I'm, I'm sitting in judgment, I'm the tribunal. The sovereign of the court's the tribunal, unless the authority is taken away from him by a jury. Yes, sir? In the Stiles Manual of the United States of America, and by professors and all colleges on the English language, the only capital letter that Well, that certainly is their rules. That's against their rules. Anything written in capital letters is fiction. But that's their rules. Yeah. And My the court. Rules, yes, but the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure and the Stiles Manual for the Federal Government also states the same thing. 
My court. I'm the tribunal. How important is what you said to me? It okay, thank you. That's the beauty of being in control. You're right, you're right, but you see, there's an old saying in common law. It's actually a maxim. The maxim, and, and maxims are legally, you can bring them in for judicial notice, okay? But there is a maxim that says small points of the law are not law. Okay? So they, they use that slicing and dicing and dividing and mixing and all that in order to trash your case when they want to. All right? And, and I say, yeah, there's some merit. You know, it's good to be educated in those things. But I believe in substance. And when you get right down to the substance, I pay attention to form because I want to put a good show on. Right. But when it comes to substance, it doesn't matter to me if it's caps or lowercase. It doesn't matter if your name or my name's in caps or lowercase. Okay? Yes, sir. Right. They claim they don't have ownership over the vessels. Right. Okay. That's mm -hmm. why it's important to run it somewhere in the paperwork. Well, it does, it's not important if you're the judge. Right. If you're the tribunal, it's not important. Or at least I don't think it would be to you. It's certainly not important to me. And remember this also, that uh, uh, one of my favorite attorneys is Abraham Lincoln. Of course, he wasn't famous for that. But what makes him my favorite attorney is that he taught me a very important point through his writings. He basically wrote that if you don't want to argue a point, don't bring it up. Okay? So there are these issues, but you just be amazed. The other side is not competent either. Not only am I not competent, neither are they. So, you know, <laughs> if we don't bring it up, they don't either. So I don't assume anything on their part. The only thing that counts with me is what's on the table. They don't want to bring it out into the open. Doesn't mean anything. Yes, sir. Okay, one more thing about styling. It might be up and down by the center versus to the right or to the left. Well, who's who's the tribunal? Who's going to judge this? Oh, that's true. That's okay, it doesn't matter if it's left side, right side style. You know. <laughs> Got to remember, this is the key thing. Let me tell you something now. All of you are going to have this problem. I had it for five years. It took me five years to get grow out of this. Maybe we can accelerate your growing out of it by bringing it to your attention. But everybody's going to have this very same problem that I have, and you just demonstrated that problem. And that is that we keep thinking that the rules are rules for us. They're not. You are cut loose. You're free. When you're a sovereign, you decree the law. You decree what the rules are. Your only problem is, is that you want to put on a good show so that the rest of the world thinks you put on a good show and that you're right. That's the primary number one criteria, okay? Number one. So if caps are important to them, sure, I'll put it in, okay? Doesn't make, I'm the guy who's the tribunal. They don't know that. They think the judge is the tribunal, see? And I let them go on with that fiction. I'm, I'm very light on that when I make, file my case, okay? In fact, the only thing I ever put in my cases relating to sovereignty, personally, is I will say right in the very first paragraph of my lawsuit, I say, I am so-and-so, you know, my name is so-and-so, <coughs> I'm one of the people of the United States or one of the people of California, either way, in this court of record, complain of such and such, and that's all it takes. That one little set of phrases establishes my sovereignty, establishes the common law, and strips the judge of his authority. Uh, that's in the example. Uh, it's short and sweet and easy, right? And a footer? Well, footnote. You mean down here? Well, that's just a notice of application. It doesn't matter as long as it's down there. Uh, it, look, if you look in the rules of court, they probably specify they want it in the center, they want it on the left, they want the page number here. Sure, those are details. And yes, uh, do put them there, but they're not critical about that. They, they're not going to, I've never seen a, a, a paper refused because it was on the middle instead of the left side. You know, that, that's petty. Huh? Is this paper available online? 
or do you have to? This will be on the CD I send to you. Okay, so legal papers on there, and then you can just type it in uh, for your computer. Yeah, you can you can uh, you and know save it, like copy that. it. It's it, it's in uh, Microsoft Word format. Okay. Right. It's a, yeah. And in this court of record, complain of oh. whatever. Uh, I'll tell you what. Do you usually explain to the judge what that means, or does he need immediately acknowledge it? I, neither. I don't explain it to him, and he does not acknowledge it. What happens is that at some point you end up in a hearing, right? And then the judge tries to make a decision. All right? And when, when the judge tries to make a decision, I simply object. By the way, all of my court hearings never last more than five minutes, okay? I don't waste time talking to the judge. Uh, I go to the court. Here's, here's a typical scenario. First meeting that I have, first hearing, whatever it is, what happens is the judge is in charge. He acts it. He knows it, okay? He's never known anything else. He never met me before or anyone like me. So then <clears throat> he, he throws his weight around. He wants this, that, or the other. At some point, I object. Right? Because I know I'm in charge, not him. And he's not doing what the sovereign wishes. So I just tell him I object. And he says, well, why do you object? Right? Isn't that the normal sequence? Yeah. He says, why do you object? And I say, well, it's not my wish. <laughs> now, now, understand, under ancient custom, my wish is my servant's command. Okay? That's a legal principle. That's not just fancy talk. <laughs> All right? So I just say it's not my wish. So then the judge says to me, well, if that's the best you can do, you're overruled. And I say, well, for the record, that's my wish. And he says, All right, noted, and moves on. And we move on without further discussion. See, I don't care what he does, that's how it goes. All right? Now, <clears throat> when the court session is over, oh, well, one other thing. He might ask me some question, whatever it is. Understand this. When you have a hearing, all of your arguments, all of your law, all of anything you have to say is already in the paperwork. Okay? There's really no need for a hearing. You, when you go to a hearing, you are not going there to add anything new. You had your chance to say what you're going to say, and it's all on paper, okay? All your arguments, everything. So why are you going to a hearing? You're going to a hearing only for one reason, one reason alone, and don't ever forget this. It's just one reason that you're going to the hearing, and that's to give the court to ask you a question if it's confused about some point. That's it. You have no right to speak. As a matter of fact, sometimes people show up to hearings and all they get is the ruling. They don't even get a chance to talk, okay? Because they already talked on paper. All right, so make sure you put everything in the paper because going to a hearing does nothing beyond what you did on paper, okay? Yes, sir. Dismissed for lack of uh, prosecution, failure to <coughs> litigate, what, whatever. That can become an excuse if they were predisposed to ruling against you anyway. Okay, but theoretically you shouldn't have to show up. Okay. <coughs> okay? If you don't show up, then they then theoretically they would move on the paperwork because that's where your real arguments are. Well, that's fine because that's what happened. The judge made a tentative ruling before the hearing even started. Sure. Sure. Um, okay, your turn. Uh, how would this work in small claims court and or mediation and or arbitration? Well, first of all, small claims court isn't a real court. I mean, if you, you watch how they operate, that <laughs> that's the bottom of the barrel for, for anything. Okay, as far, as far as mediation goes and that stuff, I mean, that's not formal court. I mean, that's an attempt to save money to avoid the, the expensive formal process. So... You know, I mean, if you're if you're going to agree to alternative methods, that's great. But you know, I'm going there as a, in a court of record. You don't say, I I am Tim Kellogg. Uh, I am one of the people of the United States. Do 
you don't start doing that, do you, on well, a breach or anything? Well, you don't, yeah, on a breach you would, but you know, the thing is, is that I would object to uh, uh, these alternative solutions. Okay? Just uh, if I, I, you know, I know they have mandatory procedures in the Roman civil law courts where they say, you know, you have to go through a certain amount of arbitration. In a way, it's good because sometimes you can hash out things informally because that's what it is. They're just trying to cut the costs and, and uh, get a little more efficiency on this. But hey, you know, it, it isn't always satisfactory. So don't even attempt to do that type of thing in those courts. I wouldn't. Uh, well, I unless you think you could win. You know, if you think you wouldn't, go for it. But I would, I, would, I would always go into it with reservations. I would not accept a mandatory settlement unless it was in my favor. Okay? You know, all it is is you're contracting. You have a right to, to a court, but you're contracting for an alternative method. You, they cannot force you into it. No. They can force you to go through the motions, but they cannot force you to go into it. No. Okay? And, and actually, you get real technical, you can issue an order suspending their order, ordering you into the, the alternative method. But this is a strategy question, okay? What do you think will work to your advantage? If you think it's to your disadvantage and you want the full, full dress court, as they say, with everything according to Hoyle, then by gollies, do it, you know? You can, you can force it because you're, you're the boss. <coughs> okay, you had a question back here? Or you have one. What, what are the rules and what requirements are there to move the court proceedings from one venue to another? I don't know. How do you find that out? Well, you look in the rules of court. Or, in, or in the, probably the Code of Civil Procedure has it, if you're talking about California. Yeah, you know, there, there are rules for changing venue. And as a matter of fact, why don't you just go to, uh, you remember earlier I suggested Matthew Bender? Or, or did you come in late? Okay, well, I mentioned Matthew Bender because Matthew Bender, the, the publications, there's two of them. There's one that's called Forms of Pleading and Practice, of which I have a sample on here, and the other one is called Points and Authorities. And these, if you look up change of venue, you'll probably find all the requirements there. Also, in the public uh, law library, they have a, a set of books called Action Guides, and these are really super neat. The Action Guides, they, they're little books, they're typically uh, a little less than a quarter inch thick, and they just go boom, 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 down the line, just the steps you go through on, on something. You want to do a change of venue? Look up one of the Action Guides and ch change of venue, and it, it, it's really nice. So that's what you should do. Um, no matter what you know, the key to success is research. So be sure to go to the library, and my primary research is Matthew Bender's uh, Forms of Pleading and Practice. My secondary research is such things as the Action Guides, or sometimes, like at, at Orange County Library, if you deposit $100 with Orange County Library, you then are entitled to borrow up to five books from the library, and uh, it, it, it's great. And you can borrow or five items, not books, but five items. And I frequently borrow their videotapes because what they do, they'll have seminars for attorneys. And they'll cover a specific subject, and they're on videotape, and it's like you attended the seminar. And you find out some neat stuff, neat techniques that you wouldn't think of. I'll tell you one of the things that I thought was pretty cute was there was a case in Georgia an accident had occurred, and there was a whole lineup of cars. And, and I don't know, 15, 20 cars, something like that. And they're all lined up there. <coughs> and over this hill, at 70 miles an hour or something, came this semi. And he just plowed through all those cars, okay? <coughs> and he kept going. And right behind him was another semi, same company, and now that the path was cleared, he went right on through, <laughs> okay? So here these two semis went on through. Well, there was quite a large uh, lawsuit for the little girl who was in the last car, and she got killed. And so uh, <coughs> they, uh, they got out of that the largest 
jury award in the history of Georgia. It was something like $5 million at that time. Well, during discovery, the defense wanted to see the evidence because, see, you're entitled to see all the evidence that's going to be presented. You're not entitled to see how the evidence gets interpreted. That's your private strategy until you make your presentation in court. But you are entitled to see the evidence. So they asked to see the evidence. And they had video evidence, okay? So they had a composite where they stuck all these different videos together into one long stream, and they said, this video contains the evidence we're going to present. And so they did, okay? And they, they, the enemy got a chance to look at it. Now, remember, there's a difference between law and strategy, okay? Boy, did these guys, the plaintiffs, exercise strategy. Because when it came time to present their case, they took the evidence that they said they had, that the other side saw they had, but they rearranged the sequence. And the last frame, the last little clip on the film that they showed, you get tears sometimes when I think of it, this cute little girl saying, bye, 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 bye. Oh my goodness. That, the, the, the defense screamed a high heaven on it. But it was on the sample, but it was in the middle. <laughs> Not the end. When they presented it, it was bye, bye, this cute little girl, bye, bye. Talk about strategy. <laughs> so, strategy is important, and you can do it too. All right. Anyway, I'm going to this. Uh, <clears throat> this is back to the main menu, okay? And <clears throat> I'll go to the example. We have an example. It's on the website also. And uh <clears throat> we'll go to the uh, uh, first amended action because that's done correctly. The Original action was not done correctly. So here's the first amended action. And normally it would have been the first paragraph, but because it was an amended action, we made it the second paragraph. But here's what it says. William Jones, here and after plaintiff, is one of the people of California and in this court of record complains of, and there you are. That's all it takes to get your sovereignty. You're setting the forum. Okay. The judge is suspended. Common law, all that's done with that simple little sentence. Okay? After that, we just did normal stuff. Okay? Back to this. <clears throat> Notice of motion. So, that is the notice. Does everybody understand the notice? Yes. Now, some mechanical things that I want you to notice. You'll notice that there's no highlighting, okay? It's just ordinary type. Some capitalizations were appropriate. The lines are numbered 1 through 28 on the left-hand side. You have a one-inch margin all around, not including the footnote or the, uh, yeah, the footnote there, the, the notice of application, and not including the numbers on the left-hand side. You want one inch all around. Preferably, you want 12-point type, space 12 points, for each line, okay? You want it double spaced. Uh, that's very typical, okay? And that's in the rules somewhere. 28 lines. 28 lines. It could be 27 lines, depending on how your typewriter works. What's could the, could be. The font? Uh, preferred font is either Courier or Times New Roman. And I think you have another choice also. They, that it's specified in the rules. 12 point, or I think 10 point is allowed now, isn't it? I'm not sure. But 12 point, you can't go wrong with typewriter type, okay? Well, that's excessive. Well, the state does anything it's want, but are you talking about your papers when you file it? Okay. Anyway, follow those rules. They're harmless. They don't affect it, and it makes everybody happy. Okay? So that is the format that you should have. Because this was a, a countersuit was involved, 
uh, it, the caption took a lot more space. Normally, you'd have more space to write <laughs> on the bottom, but that's what you do. Okay. Sure. Space, sure. They are out there somewhere. You I have that in Microsoft Word also. Okay. Uh, yeah, this. Perfect. See, you have Microsoft Word here, and um, and Word Perfect has it. So we go to New. Okay. This brings up the menu. Pleadings. Okay. There's your pleading wizard, and it puts stuff together. I never use it. <coughs> partly because of ignorance, partly because it's so easy. What I do is I just set the margins, type what I'm going to type, and then after I print it all through, I make a second run through and I just print the numbers. In effect, I have post-numbered paper instead of pre-numbered paper. <laughs> but, but it works. <coughs> okay. So that is the notice. You give notice <laughs> to the opposition. Okay. Now, moving to the next paper. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, here we are. I think this is it. All right. So after the notice of motion, you now have the actual motion. And again, top box. Yep. And I'm no, gonna, no. I'm gonna kill that too. Yeah, I think that'll take care of it. Now in a motion, <coughs> remember. A lot of people really get wordy on these motions, all right? Look, all you're doing is you're sta saying to the court in the motion what it is that you want from the court. That's it. You're not justifying it. You're not supporting it with anything. You're simply saying, this is what I want from you, okay? So same format. Got your address in the upper left-hand corner. By the way, on my later papers now, I never put a phone number. And I never put a job title. I'm not in propria persona. I'm not sui juris. None of that stuff. I simply put my name. Why? Because that is the contact. Okay? I might put I might might put plaintiff because that's what I am. Self in law? As self in law. Well you could do that. But see Remember, titles do not count. All that counts is what's in the body. So if you want to put that stuff, great. But I've just decided, well, you know, uh, maybe uh, put plaintiff up there if, if you want to put something. But I avoid all misinterpretations. Why did you come to that decision? Um, I thought that uh, there was a lot of uh, confusion around and the meanings of different things. and. And besides, I like Abraham Lincoln. If you don't want to bring up, you don't want to cover a point. Don't bring it up. Okay? Let them bring it up. If you don't like it, you can argue. A lot of times they forget, which is just great. So you have the same idea. <coughs> Here's the line eight. Remember this. This is this is true throughout the United States. Line eight is the court name. Okay? Line number eight. Uh huh. Oh really? Mm hmm. Right, light number eight, always the court name. It doesn't matter where anything else is, but make sure line eight is the court name, okay? Okay, so now here we are. <coughs> this is the motion, short and sweet. William R. Thornton hereby applies for an ex party order substituting himself for William C. Thornton as plaintiff in the above entitled court. This application is based on the declaration of William R. Thornton attached here too and on the attached memorandum of points and authorities, respectfully submitted. That's all a motion is. See, when you're going to a court, you're only going for, to a court for one reason and one reason alone. You want them to produce an order in your favor, whatever it is you want. You could say, I move that the court exclude all people wearing pink shoes. Okay? That would be your motion. Now, you might not get it awarded. You know, the judges will resist that, probably. I think it's a reasonable thing to ask for, but they don't for some reason. So, but that's it. That's all there is to a motion. 
You just say in very distinct, clear things, what decision do you want from them? Any questions on that? Yes, sir. I've heard things about never use compound sentences. Do you have everything as short, simple, and direct as possible? Well, that's true. You want it, you're writing for people who are not always uh, good readers. So yeah, you, you should avoid compound sentences, I guess. Uh, you know, but uh, in a way, who's in charge? Whose court is this? Boy, does that clear up a lot of problems, doesn't it? That's what I like about being sovereign. You know, it's my court. As long as you're the defendant, though, it doesn't work. Yes, ma'am. Um, my question is, um, how is it that attorneys can be exempt from, um, let's say, being questioned about collusion or their intent? Uh, because they're not witnesses to the court. Okay. You know, if, they, if that see, thing you bring into the court is things that are relevant to the case. If you can show a, a nexus of some kind, well, sure, they can be questioned. But if you can, you can for instance, show a nexus uh, where the attorney and the client, and, and you have a witness, yeah. are actually planning and plotting, so to speak, to get Your you. attorney is, is... No, not my attorney. Let's say, the, let's say I'm the defendant and we have the plaintiff who decides to go into my pockets and finds a way to do it. <laughs> yeah. And he's got this attorney who is expert at knowing how to do exactly what he wants. Sure. And they actually happen to be boyfriends. And he happens to also be an attorney. And he's Very an expert common situation. of his kind of, yeah, exactly. So they happen to, to be at the place. I happen to have a witness that heard all of this going on. Sure. How can you bring something like that into Well, what showing? you do, it comes down to a motion. You go to the court and you move for sanctions. Oh. Time out for tape change. So you actually move for a sanction? Why, why, don't you, uh, why don't you stop the tape just a second so I can do another nose blowing session. So to answer your question about this, um, you have this misbehaving attorney, which you believe is misbehaving. What you do is a motion. That's what we're talking about, <coughs> motions. You make a motion. And you can ask for anything. You're saying he's a bad guy, he's, he's unethical, and you want them to extract $100 out of him or $500 or whatever, you know, you, you name it, okay? But, like I said, you can make a motion for anything, you can ask for anything, but there are certain forms that if you go, if you follow these forms, it makes it easier. Why does it make it easier? Because they are familiar with it. That's all. You don't have to use the forms, but they're more familiar with it, and if you follow the format, then it's easier for them to, to take your side. But in this case, what you really want is sanctions. That's what it's called. You ask for sanctions against the attorney because the attorney is doing something he should not. And you have your witness, okay? That's what you do. <coughs> so it's a, it's a question of sanctions. Thank you. You're welcome. So, um, all right, so, here it is. You see, here is the motion. Just applies for an ex parte order, substituting himself. All right. Respectfully submitted. There we go. Okay. Signed. Petitioner. Dated a certain date. <clears throat> By the way, the addresses on these forms and the uh, and the dates and so forth. <clears throat> don't look to these forms for any consistency there because I just, although they came from an actual court case, I might have reformatted them in the light of what I know now as opposed to then so that these are now correct. In, all right, so the, I'm just showing the form. Don't look at the content, <laughs> all right? So, <clears throat> but that's basically all the motion is, just that little bit. Okay, so let's go back to the next step. So everybody so far understand what a no notice of motion is and what a motion is. Any questions about that? No questions? Okay. 
we'll go to the next step, affidavits. Now, I hear a lot of people say affidavit. <laughs> it's not an affidavit. It's an affidavit. Okay? Or a declaration. Do you know what the difference is between an affidavit and a declaration? Well, in California, on a practical level, there is no difference between the two. But the theoretical difference between an affidavit and a declaration is that a declaration is public and affidavit is private. In an affidavit, you say what you're going to say on paper and then you file it and nobody knows it exists except you and maybe the notary if you had it notarized. Okay? But in, uh, uh, if you make a declaration, that means you've publicized it, you've served it on other people. Now, an affidavit can become a declaration when you go public with it. You don't, but you continue to call it an affidavit because that's what it originally was. So that's the technical difference between them. But in practical terms, it absolutely <coughs> makes no difference whatsoever whether you call it an affidavit or declaration. It's going to be the same thing. Okay? Now, <coughs> an affidavit uh, or declaration has certain forms. Now, I want you to know that the volume of lawsuits is so great in California that the Council on Judicial Performance, I guess it is, or is that what it's called, or the Judicial Council, they're trying to standardize some of these forms. So you have forms for complaints, you have forms for summons, you have forms, you know, there's all kinds of forms. They got hundreds of forms. Some of the forms are mandatory. Now, in theory, if you're sovereign, you open your own court, you don't have to pay any attention to that. But the fact of the matter is, is that these forms exist, frankly, because these problems pop up over and over again. They're familiar with them. And so if you use their forms, uh, you're now giving something that they're familiar with, and it becomes easier for them to either agree or disagree with you. Yes? Um, I have a question. Let's say you have two declarations that are with this attorney that I'm speaking of. And the declarations are untrue. And there are witnesses to refute those declarations. What happens? Their witnesses refute the declarations? Absolutely. Well, why don't you get declarations from their witnesses where they're refuting it? The, the witnesses did um, make do the uh, declarations, and the attorneys never used them. They said that, the, that, that that's going to come later. Well, do you have copies of the declarations? Yes. Okay. And notarized. And, and you're saying that those witnesses are refuting those? No, no, no. The, the, yeah, the witnesses are refuting the declarations because they were actually there, because all of it is based on hearsay. But they were actually physically there. Yeah, but they made a declaration saying what they saw, right? The, let's say the, the plaintiff's attorney's witnesses made two declarations. Sure. Then let I have two witnesses that were physically there uh -huh. and made their declarations to sure. refute what these other declarations are. Okay, so you have a conflict of evidence. Right. All right. Well, right. you see, when it comes to judgment time, the, tri the tribunal, whoever that may be, is going to have to decide which witness is telling the truth. That's a normal problem in any court proceeding. A conflict of evidence? Yeah. Well, if you want to call it that, but you know, I'm, I'm speaking plain English now. You know, you, you have, you got, here's a piece of evidence, here's a piece of evidence, and they conflict. Well, now you got to decide which one's the truth and which one's the lie. That's normal, that's what courts are for. Okay? So, yeah, you got a problem. So, you got to get, if you've got two witnesses that were physically there and you got two witnesses saying that I heard something, well, then obviously direct observation takes precedence over hearsay. hearsay. And hearsay is not usable anyway unless the person's making a, a dying statement. That's the only time hearsay is good. You know? What is a dying statement? He's well, dying. He's, he's, somebody's dying. You, somebody gets shot and he says, Joe's shot me, and then he dies. Okay? <laughs> and nobody, nobody saw it, but they did hear the dying person say it. And since he's dead, they will accept that hearsay. When somebody says, I heard him say Joe killed him, 
that is acceptable in court. That's the only time hearsay is acceptable. I think it's the only time. <laughs> okay? <clears throat> all right. So, all right, an affidavit. So every, every motion must have an affidavit or a declaration of just the facts. Okay? Just the facts. I thought we got rid of that. Open, open. Yep, yep. Okay. Every declaration must be supported by facts, okay, not opinion. What are facts? Okay, you ever heard of who, what, where, when, why, and how? Yeah. Okay. Facts consist of who, what, where, when, yeah. how, yeah. but not why. Okay, why is opinion. So, but all the others are factual. Who, what, where, when, why? Not why, and how. Okay? That's the factual thing. Also, facts must include six senses. Facts must include six senses. Hearing, seeing, feeling, smelling. What's the other one? Was it touching? Well, that's feeling. What is it? No, no, it isn't. No. Yeah, hearing, smelling, feeling, seeing, tasting. That's the five. The sixth one is what you were thinking, how it impacted your mind. You can testify to your state of mind. Okay, that's the sixth one. In other words, you can say, I was scared. Okay? Or I was intimidated. That you can say. You cannot say that he was intimidated. But you can say, I was intimidated. Could you say, he appeared to be intimidated? No. But you can say, he appeared to you to be intimidated. Let's say <coughs> that you're standing outside a wall. <coughs> There's two people inside. One of them murders the other one. <coughs> and you hear the one who's doing the killing, you hear him talking and you recognize his voice. Okay? You can be a witness to the murder because that involved your hearing. It's a fact. That was his voice. I know his voice. I recognize it. You can testify to that in court. You see? Because it involves the five senses. <clears throat> so you don't have to see it. You see, most people think that to be a witness, you have to see something. It's not true. To be a witness, you have to see it, hear it, smell it, feel it, something. One of the five senses, okay? or you testify to the impact it had on you, on your mind. Okay, so that's what a fact is. <clears throat> All right, now, again, same format, okay? You can get standard forms from the Judicial Council for affidavits, they have them. So, like I said, some of the forms are mandatory, some of them are uh, optional. I like using, op uh, using my forms because, frankly, I'm comfortable with them. But I have to tell you one thing about these forms. <coughs> that is that the forms have a lot of boxes and check marks and, you know, things that are common to many cases. I want to warn you that if you have a certain issue and you leave something out that's critical to the issue and you, you left it out because it was not on the form, too bad, okay? The Judicial Council wants you to use these forms, but they take no responsibility for making sure they're complete and correct, all right? So it's up to you to make sure that every element is covered. Again, I recommend Matthew Bender's books, okay? Forms of Pleading and Practice, and points and authorities, okay? 
So you got an issue? Go through their checklist. They're, they're great. Yes, ma'am. attorney um, gets a declaration that phrases everything that these people are saying in the context that would make it in his favor or sounds like he's a good strategist right what so stops you from doing the same thing nothing okay <laughs> you know I mean that's you're entitled to put your best foot forward that's not considered bad ethics to to make yourself look good as long as you don't lie now if it becomes an actual lie, it's an actual lie. ah well then you have a basis for sanctions because okay. attorneys are not supposed to encourage their clients to lie okay and if you have evidence that they're encouraged it that's a place for sanctions make a motion for sanctions go to matthew bender and look up sanctions <clears throat> okay sure you know anybody pulls a fraud on the court and even if you don't find a specific rule, you can make up a rule. Well, I mean, you've expressed your instance, case, right? For instance, is I'm asking you, you know, you just came into the neighborhood. You just moved in next door to me. Yeah, look, yeah. I don't want to get into the specifics of cases, okay? Yeah. We're staying with the motions. Right. But I'm telling you that if you've got an issue with, with somebody lying on it, you ask for sanctions. Okay. That's, that's the answer. Or you... You get a court deter you get it thrown out. You make a motion to have that particular thing thrown out because it's an obvious lie. Mm -hmm. Is Matthew Bender on the internet? Um, I don't know if it is or not, but I do know you can go to the public library and it's there for free. They have the books and they have it on CD. The CDs you cannot borrow, but what I did is I went there and I copied sections onto a diskette. Okay? And that's all. It's real easy. <coughs> Okay, anyway, so here is, um, in this case, I was applying for substitution of plaintiff, okay? So this is, this is the affidavit, the facts, nothing but the facts, ma'am. So <clears throat> I am William R. Thornton, I'm the petitioner in this case. I have personal knowledge of the following facts and I'm competent to testify as the truth of these fa facts, if called a witness, okay? That's boilerplate. You want that on every affidavit that you have. That first paragraph, the first two paragraphs right there are standard. You put it on there. Now, you all have heard about getting your affidavits notarized, right? Well, you don't have to get them in, it notarized. If you go, if you put onto your uh, affidavit statement, what you see there, and you put also with the end, I declare in a penalty appropriate that the foregoing is true and correct and that this declaration was executed in such and such a city on such and such a date. The three paragraphs, the first two and the last one, if you do that, you do not have it notarized. Okay? It's equivalent to having it notarized. Yeah. So some people like having it notarized. You know, understand that court process a lot of it is intimidation. A lot of it is strategy. So if you think that the enemy would be somehow psychologically impacted because you got a notary's certificate on there or something like that, well, then you do it. Because this uh, court process is primarily law, but secondarily, it's psychological warfare. Okay? And I think a lot of you know have experienced the impact of that. Okay, so now... Here's, here's an example of facts. <coughs> okay, here it is. On December 25th, 1984, Christmas Day, William C. Thornton plaintiff passed away. The certificate of death is attached as Exhibit B and is incorporated by reference as though fully stated herein. That's another thing that'll save you a lot of writing. That little phrase, incorporated by reference as though fully stated herein. When you do that, you have an attachment, you put that in there, absolutely is the same as if you wrote it all out. Okay? I use that phrase a lot. Incorporated by reference as though fully stated herein. That's the phrase. You put that in there, 
you can bring in stuff without making your motion large. Most courts have about a 15 page limitation on your motion. Okay? You try to keep your motions down to 15 pages. Sometimes it's difficult to do. <coughs> or your affidavit, whatever. Actually, the affidavits can be as long as necessary if, they're, if they are relevant facts. It's the uh, briefs that you want to keep down to 15 pages. But the, now, you, if, if you need more, you can always make a motion to the court. Again, a motion, okay, with all the same stuff, same idea. But you can ask the court for permission to have a longer, more pages. And if you have a complex case, you can do that. But <clears throat> anyway. Why are the exhibits reversed? Well, because I, because I labeled them first and I used them second. It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. <clears throat> See, I'm asking the court to allow me to substitute in as a the new plaintiff. So it's relevant to the to the motion when we say the pa that the uh, plaintiff died, right? I mean, <laughs> after all, I want to be substituted in, right? So that's what it is. And then you and here's the proof. Here's the certificate of death. Okay, so. <clears throat> Before the plaintiff passed away, he granted power of attorney to me to resolve the conflict. The power of attorney is attached as Exhibit A and is incorporated by reference as though fully stated herein. I am an heir to William, uh, of William C. Thornton. I'm also ex executor of his estate. And I had a will that made me that, okay? <clears throat> I have been continuously and intimately involved in the case at all times. My interests have been identical to those of William C. Thornton. I have been likewise injured by the activities of the other parties in this case. In substance, there is no differences be among the interests of William C. Thornton, his estate, and those of myself. Okay? Now, <clears throat> those are the factual things. A little bit conclusionary when I said there are no differences. See, that's a conclusion. That's not really acceptable. But basic, what is a fact is that I have been continuously and in intimately involved in this case at all times. My interests have been identical to those of William C. Thornton and so forth. In substance, so I made a conclusionary statement. In substance, there are no differences and so forth, but the conclusion was made after I presented the supporting evidence. Okay? You don't make conclusionary statements uh, all by themselves on an affidavit. If you are going to throw one in, make sure you built the base first with facts before you make it, then it's okay. But you always want to put the facts in so that the reader will come to that same conclusion at the same time that you present the conclusion. Okay? So there you have the affidavit. That's all there is to it. It's in court format. Okay? It has the 28 lines down the side of the page. It has the, uh, the uh, little label at the bottom. Declaration of, you know, in, in support of application, so that they can see what it is, has the page numbering, and uh, so forth. So, okay, makes sense? Yeah. I'm keeping up. So now we have a separate affidavit. Say, say Bill, uh, yes, sir. You asked the magistrate to go over 15 pages, or you asked the court yourself? I'm a little confused because you use the well, words interchangeably. Well, I, I'm using it interchangeable. All of this stuff applies equally to the uh, normal <coughs> equity courts, just as it does in the common law court. So it's the same thing, but there is an advantage to being the decision maker. Why did you go 16 pages deliberately on Aurora's, and you said it did it deliberately? Now, why was that? Oh what? no, no, I don't. I didn't go. I didn't use pages, I didn't generate pages on purpose, no. I don't know what I was saying deliberately, but it wasn't that. Well, I'm, I thought you said if it's yeah. 15, why did you go 16? Well, because it required it. You, who'd you ask, yourself? Nobody. Okay. I, nobody, I just assumed they'd accept it because it was only one page. Okay, all right. You know, you, you can, it, it's, it's okay. a rule, but you know, I mean, they face reality too. 
You're asking the court. And you as the court. Well, if you're the court, you can turn around and prove it. Yourself, basically, you just have to give them notice that uh, you're going over. Wouldn't that be? Well, more? yeah. I mean, the other side gets a chance to be heard before you move the court, before you actually issue the orders. You ought to hear from all points of view. So you would basically say 16 pages are needed. Yeah. I, if if I were actually to go formal and ask the court for permission to have 15 pa uh, 16 pages instead of 15 pages, sure. And then if I'm the tribunal, I turn around and either approve or disapprove. Probably right. would approve. Okay, that's <laughs> the clarification. Thank you. But you know, you have to have an element of neutrality when you put on the tribunal hat. See, I mean, it's like <clears throat> in this one case, the uh, in the example case where I went and I showed you the uh, that second paragraph, you know, about the people in the court of record. All right, in that case. Uh, we made an accusation against the judge for contempt of court. We also made an accusation against the clerk because they were in cahoots with each other. Okay? So as when wearing the plaintiff's hat, <coughs> we were hitting real hard. We were throwing all the punches. We we're saying this guy talked to this guy and we want the court and you know we're yelling for contempt of court. But as soon as we switched hats and now we became tribunal we ultimately decided that the clerk was subject to undue influence from the judge and that the clerk really couldn't be held responsible. Okay? So here we are on the plaintiff's side, we're aggressive, we're out to attack everybody, but then when we become the judge, we move to the center, we say, well, wait a minute, what's the story here, you know? What's really reasonable? And it, it takes some psychological rearrangement because you're in a mindset when you're writing your complaint, you know, when you're, when you're beefing about something. But then you have to, when you, if you are indeed going to be the sovereign of the court and indeed the, the tribunal of the court, you absolutely must rearrange your attitudes, become neutral, pretend that the person you're judging is not you anymore but someone else. How would you do if it were someone else that were, came to you? So you really, really should do that. And if you do that, you'll get a lot of respect from the people. You know, if you just go in and slash and burn because you've got the advantage of being the sovereign, believe me, it's not going to work. Because you see, the common law reaches everywhere. And when I say everywhere, I mean, you, look, common law ultimately comes down to a very simple definition. It's the opinion of your public, okay, public opinion. And part of your public is the clerks, the judges, the sheriffs, the marshals, as well as the newspaper reporters if they're looking at your case, as well as your friends or whatever, okay? That's public opinion. Well, if you, when you put on your tribunal hat and they're reading through your reasoning process, your logical processes, you want them to come away with opinion, hey, you are really being fair with these people. You're really coming to decision. These decisions that we make, whenever I put on the tribunal hat, all of a sudden I become a very kind person. I don't allow this person to, the, the claimant, to get all he wants, including myself as a claimant. So you're thrashing away as a plaintiff. Everybody understands that. Yeah, you're going after him. Okay, you've got a lot of resentment, a lot of hurt, and so forth. But when you're the tribunal, You've got to throw out all those emotions. You've got to be absolutely neutral. And the idea, the number one function of all judges is status quo. I don't know if you've noticed that. But it's status quo. Whatever is, is. They're not going to let you hit back, even when you, they should. Okay? So there's a reason why 98% or 99% of all cases against corporations are lost lost by the people doing the suing. And it, it's that, <coughs> that uh, statistic is because judges go for status quo, whatever it is. Their job is to settle things, not to be fair. Okay? So I do the same thing because, frankly, in my own personal philosophy, I see merit in keeping things settled. There's nothing you don't want to be continuing the fight. You want to settle the fight. That's why it was when we 
when we, uh, <clears throat> this guy that got hit on the bicycle, he wanted to go for more than $2 million. I said, no, hold off, $2 million's enough, okay? Got $100,000 in medical bills and you got a lot of uh, impact on your future earnings and so forth, but $2 million will cover you, okay? Don't go for more. And eventually he saw the light and stayed with $2 million. You know, you, but you see these billion dollar lawsuits and, and the people who ask for that billion dollars, I know they're genuinely hurt, they're angry. But when you put on that tribunal hat, you want to be, kind of emulate the judges in some degree that it is correct. But at least you don't have to be unjust when you do it. You know, get back to reality. <clears throat> and sometimes if you don't know what to sue for, look at comparative cases and see what they sued for. There's plenty of judgments that did win. And when somebody goes to jail on a false arrest, I say, well, uh, lawsuits that I've seen in the past seem to run about 50000 a day for false arrests. Okay? Seems like a reasonable figure. Well, one case, a guy got a million and a quarter a day. And that was in Florida. But, <clears throat> you know, that's, that's unusual. What's usual? I know when you're in jail, you feel like a billion a day would be fair. But <clears throat> you just got to use some sense and, and conform in because remember, I repeat this over and over again, it is the custom and usage that counts. That's what common law is about, public opinion. Put on a good show and do what other people seem reasonable and you have a better chance of, of being successful in, your, in getting cooperation. I don't want the sheriff to go out and telephone first telling the, the, the person that he's coming out to collect the bill. I want that sheriff to believe in my cause, okay? And he's not going to, he's not gonna go out and collect a billion dollars from a guy who owns a one, room, one bedroom house. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, well, <clears throat> anyway, so this is the declaration. And you'll notice that in the caption, it says, Declaration of William R. Thornton. All right, and it says in support of application for substitution of plaintiff. So the original motion was application for substitution of plaintiff. That was the name. So I copy that name, and then I say that it's a declaration in support of that. That way, when the person picks up the paper, he looks at the title, it gives him an idea of what the point of view is. Again, you're making it easy for the reader. Okay? <coughs> so. Use the caption. Now, oh, another word about this caption over here. You'll notice that we have the full list of defend defendants stated. Um, you don't have to do that. Whoever is the first one on the list, you put, like here, it would be Corbett E. Britton. You could say et al. E.T. space A.L. period. E.T. means and. And A-L period, I forget what the Latin word is, but it means others. It's and others. Okay. Hmm? Symbol for versus V-S. V or V-S, either way. Uh, oh, okay. I, I understood that V is more proper. Is that correct? Anybody? Not that I know of. Okay. Actually, I think V-S was the original, but I guess they started saving ink. They <laughs> cut it down to V. Papers saved. I guess, yeah. <clears throat> but everybody knows what it means now. Uh, with using V sometimes. <coughs> All right. Well, anyway, <coughs> so that's that's the affidavit. Um, okay. So let's move on to the next item. Points and authorities. Now, points and authorities actually consist of three parts. It's the point that's being made, the supporting authority, meaning law or maybe horn books that have uh, uh, some sort of uh, well-reasoned statements in them. Could be uh, uh, statements out of American jurisprudence. Amjur is, is highly respected. Caljur is highly respected. So you can quote those authorities, okay? <coughs> so, and then you have the argument in support of the point. So you see, you state your points are being made, you state the law, basically, and then you take the entire ball of wax, that is the affidavits, the law, 
and you argue your case, and this is where you put your emotion in. Okay, this is where you really state your cause. It's just as if you were in front of a jury, and you're you're trying to convince that jury why it is you're right. That's what the argument is for. This is the only place in all of the motion where you can actually make conclusionary statements legitimately. Okay, you cannot state a conclusion in an affidavit unless it's fully supported by the facts that lead up to it. You cannot state a conclusion in your authorities part of your points and authorities. You can only state your conclusion in the points and in the argument and nowhere else. Okay? So here's an example of points and authorities. Okay, as you can see, we have the same format in the caption. <coughs> and <coughs> we say points and authorities in support of application for substitution of plaintiff, ex parte. Now, if you were on the defending side, somebody was making a motion, you would call this points and authorities against the application for substitution of plaintiff. Okay? Same idea, just change a couple words. Okay, you have the normal caption on the left. Okay, now, <coughs> you'll see that you have those three lines, lines 24 tw and 25, and those three lines are in all capital letters. And that's the point that you're trying to make to the court. Okay? William R. Thornton should be substituted for plaintiff William C. Thornton. That's the point I'm trying to make. So I put it there. So in your points and authorities, you have points, you have authorities and argument. Those capital letters right there are the point that you're trying to make. So now the court or whoever reads your paper has a clear idea what it is that you're after. Okay? Now the next part is the authority. Okay? Quote, although this section in permissive terms provides that court may allow action or proceeding to be continued by or against his representative or successor in interest, personal representative of person who has filed a suit before death has, by custom and practice, absolute right to expect and demand substitution if the cause of action on which the suit was commenced by decedent during his lifetime survives or continues. And that was Majors versus Merced County in 1962. 207 Cal 2nd, 427, 24 Cal, Cal Reporter, 610. Okay, now these sites, I guess you understand the 207 is the, uh, that's the volume number, Cal, California Appellate Court, 2nd. That, that's the second set that they've generated. And 427 is the page number that it's on in that particular volume. Does everybody understand that, I guess? Okay. That's how you do a site. It's volume, what book it is, what set of books, and what page number. Okay. So that's one of the authorities that I'm citing. <coughs> The settled practice is to allow substitution of the personal representative of the plaintiff on suggestion of his death and ex parte motion to allow the substitution. Campbell versus West in 1892. Apparently they had a fight over this and the court, Supreme Court, I guess, uh, said uh, that, that's what they said there. Where the cause of action arises out of violation of a property right and not of personal right, cause of action survives the death of the wrongdoer. <coughs> Singley versus Bigelow. All right, so that, that is the authority that I'm, I'm citing. Yes? So how did you come up with those authorities? That's called research. You all, go all right, how does one go about right. researching something like You've that? You've got it. You, look, I didn't know. So I went to the law library. I said, death. Well, you know? Right. You start looking up. Uh, lo let's see. Is there some way that I can deal with this? You know, you, 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 it's like on the internet. You put in keywords and see what pops up. Believe me, it, it's a, 
you, there's a lot of reference books out there. You look up in American Jurisprudence again. You look up in uh, uh, in Matthew Bender's uh, forms of pleading forms of pleading and practice. You, it's called research. <coughs> you don't know in advance. Mm -hmm. You know you got a problem, and you pick out the best words you can figure out that might apply to the problem. You start looking up in these reference texts. It is a search problem, definitely. I mean, I wasn't getting smarter with you. It's actually you're you're dealing with the unknown when you start, and you have to get in and 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 look, and there is a biblical reference to that. I think it says, "Seek and ye shall find." Okay, and that's exactly how I did this. I I did the seeking and I did the finding. Right, but how do you get knowledge? You go hunting. Jones. You know, how do you get food in the jungle? You go hunting. <coughs> you know, due yes, diligence. Sir. When when doing points and authorities uh, and mentioning case law, we should cite as as prince as uh, were you illustrating principles of law that were decided on, uh, let's say, some previous Supreme Court cases, and we have a right to rely on that unless they get overturned. Well, uh, uh, look, <coughs> if you're in your sovereign capacity, case law does not apply to you. Black letter law does not apply to you. On the other hand, public opinion <laughs> is of a direct interest to you. So, because it's a direct interest to you, because you want to look good, yeah, you do pay attention to case law. But it's not binding. It is binding on the judges. It is binding. They took an oath to support the laws and blah, 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 okay? Right. So, yeah, I hold them to those standards. But for myself, gotcha. the sovereign, the very, remember what it said? The very essence of sovereignty is that the sovereign decrees the law. Right. When I, when I set up my court cases, I decree what the rules of court are. Quite often in a state case, I decree that the rules of court are the federal rules of civil procedure. I toss out the entire California rules of court that way. It's my court. <coughs> yes, sir. You go along in the case law uh, dates, and it says, well, this one's better. This is, uh, let's see, that's 1930s. There might be another, but yeah, you're talking about 1940s, shepherdizing. shepherdizing. Mm -hmm. um, in, in, when you're the sovereign, you select which one. Do you mm -hmm. listen to that in your research? Well, yes, because, you see, these, these cases that are written, the court has gone public on its reasoning process. And the courts are in a glass, you know, they're in a fishbowl. And so when you, when you read these uh, opinions, they're pretty solid usually. At least that's been my experience, my interpretation. So you want the latest? Well, yeah, you want the best of the reasoning. But you know what? All, all of these cases that I've ever seen, like our class of people seem to run into, they're very fundamental. They don't depend on fine points of the law, which, by the way, is not law at all. But, you know, all of our cases are pretty gross. Somebody came and beat somebody up. And where was the warrant? Or where was the, you know, just, we, we deal with raw power here, and it's very crude at times, meaning it, it is raw power. And, and so, uh, shepherdizing a case, I suppose you could do it. But, you know, I've never shepherdized any of my cases. Except right in the beginning, I, I figured it out, and I said, well, wait a minute. My cases are so gross, whatever, I mean, so plain, so simple, to, uh, that, that common sense tells you where the right and the wrong of it is. You don't have to be any trained jurist to realize that somebody punched you out when you didn't ask for it. <laughs> you know? Right. If that's what I'm saying. We, I haven't felt the need to really genuinely shepherdize in depth. Uh, I just go for the surface, look up the latest books, get some reasonable closeness. If the case appears to apply, I use it. I'll tell you, I've never had anybody come back and say that one of my cases was superseded by one of their cases. Never had that happen. Yeah, I notice the other side sometimes uses cases don't even apply to what they're talking about. 
Yeah, you know, there, there's, uh, and a lot of times if you, if you do get a case that's cited, you know, from the opposition or one you use yourself, be sure to read it, go and read it, because a lot of times they misquote it. <laughs> In fact, there's a uh, case, it involves a police officer who was looking for equal protections under the law because he had scored too high on a test and, uh, and they wouldn't hire him, okay? He was too smart. Uh, the average intelligence of a policeman is 104 IQ, okay? It's the same as uh, secretaries and bank tellers. So uh, he had a scored something way up there, 120, I guess, or I don't know, 118, somewhere up there. And because he had scored so high, he felt he, he merited the job, but they wouldn't hire him. And he claimed a few things, but one of the things that he brought into the case, this was in the state of Maine, and just recently too, meaning in the past 10 years, I think, mm -hmm. uh, he tried to bring in some issue of sovereignty, personal sovereignty, okay? I don't remember how he tried to fit it in. And the Supreme Court itself, one of the Supreme Court justices misquoted a prior case. And I knew about it because I looked it up. And sure enough, he had misquoted. It didn't quite fit in my mind, you know, and uh, having something to do about sovereignty. And, uh, and he was denying it. And he actually put it in quote marks, but when I read it, it was nowhere in the case. So what did you do? I didn't do anything. It wasn't my case. It was in Maine, oh, okay. and I was here. Okay. What would you do in the, well, you would have to know, I guess, during the trial. But after the fact and his final decision, if he made something that was in us, that he based the whole thing was based on a misquote. What would you do? I'd make a motion for reconsideration, okay. or motion for to change the judgment. You can move for anything, yeah, right. and you'll find some case somewhere that supports your your idea of what should be done. <laughs> There's plenty of cases out there. Oh yeah, whatever. <laughs> okay. There's plenty of case law. There's now case law for any position you want to take, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, Anyhow, yeah, see the idea, what I want you all to understand is this, is that <clears throat> although I'm talking a little bit, you notice how this how often do you see a request for substitution of plaintiff? Never. Yeah, that never happens. So <coughs> what I want you to look at here is the form that it's in, okay? Because this form applies to everything, all motions. All right. There are certain specialized motions that might require specialized forms or certain factors, but this is what you base it on, this particular form. And so you can see, and I, I put it in complete form with line numbers and everything so that you could see, okay? <coughs> All right, so we quoted the cases. We're back on the brief here. The brief has two names. Sometimes it's called a brief. Usually in California, it's called points and authorities. It means the same thing, okay? So now that we've got the authority, we made our point first up above, all right? William R. Thornton should be substituted for plaintiff William C. Thornton. We made our point. Now we've put in the authorities, case law that we found that was relevant. And then we went to <coughs> The, uh, the argument. And so now, starting with line 17, this is where I'm arguing before the court, okay? Just as if I were standing in front of a jury. And I say, cause of action survives decedent because it arises out of a violation of property right. William R. Thornton is the representative of William C. Thornton. Also, substitution would represent a change in form only and not a change in substance, okay? The settled practice is to allow substitution of personal representatives. Therefore, application of William R. Thornton to be substituted for William C. Thornton should be granted. Respectfully submitted. We're coming to the end of a four-hour DVD. So okay. We'll break the reload. That'd be great. All right. Well, let me, uh, are you at the end or you're coming to the end? We're, we're about 30 seconds, 20 seconds away. It's okay. Uh, well, pretty, yeah, I think that was a good breaking point. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes.